blinding, blinding light. Uh, but on behalf of uh, the Blue Stocking Bookstore, on behalf of the uh, Beaver location, Beaver Street location, I think. Yes. Uh, on behalf of Midnight Notes, uh, we would like to welcome visitors from afar, from Bristol, England, the home of the slave trade and mercantilism, Boo! Uh, to New York City, right across from the Customs House. Boo! Here we are, right down from Wall Street. Boo! Boo! We want to give a rah-rah to our comrades uh, from the radical history group of Bristol, England, which has uh, renewed our energies, the transatlantic, against slavery, against the Wall Street. And they're going to help show us how to do it and how we can go forward. Is that about right, Roger? All right. Welcome, Maureen. OK. Um, yeah, my name is Roger, if you don't know me, from Bristol Radical History Group. Um, and first of all, I'll do the thank yous. Get them out of the way now. And we'll do the proper thank yous later and grab some food. But um, I'd just like to say thank you, first of all, to this, this meeting space to put us on, this meeting group. Also, especially to Midnight Notes and Sylvia and George, even all the others who helped to get us over here. Um, some of us have never been to New York before, some of us have never been to USA. So it's been an interesting and uh, educational experience, I would say. And we've had a great time so far. This, this meeting is entitled uh, Why History Matters and Why Radical History Matters More. Um, and we've, it kind of fits in with the program this week. Just last night at uh, the Brett Forum, we did a presentation about our group uh, and our activities. And tonight, we're going to change that a little bit and look at, do, actually do some history, hopefully. Uh, so we've got four talks tonight, and I'll go through them in a minute. Um, the plan is, is that we will try and do those talks kind of on the hour. They should last somewhere around 30, 40 minutes. We have time for discussion. So, you know, it's fine if people want to listen to a couple and then leave. I'm sure people will be coming in at different stages. So don't feel like you've got to stay in and nip off and come back for another talk if you want. If you do leave, they will be deeply offended. So, you know. <laughs> anyway, last night we talked about four strands of. Um, or four kind of analytical approaches that have been developed by a group. And the word I used was praxis last night. The reason I used that is because it means the kind of unification of theory and practice and action, a, pro a process. So the these four things that I'll go through, these four threads, have kind of developed out of the work we've done. And hopefully there's four case studies tonight that kind of give you an idea about how we've explored those different themes. And those, those, those threads or themes are the following four things. First of all, we're very much interested in uncovering hidden history, particularly local to Bristol, but as Peter's already pointed out, Bristol's a port city, so that kind of connects us across the world to many other places, including New York. Um, secondly, we're, we're very much interested in looking at uh, critiquing established narratives of history, so what I would call establishment histories, dominant ideas in, 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 our, in our various countries and nations, which are up for critique. Thirdly, we've also recently, I would say in the last year or so, begun to look at critiquing established radical narratives. So looking back at previous radical histories over the last 100, 150 years in particular, uh, and, and critiquing those and so we're looking into those, looking into why those histories are presented the way they are. And finally, we're very much interested in connecting all of those bits, hidden histories and critiquing narratives. Um, trying to connect those things with current struggles. So hopefully the four talks tonight will kind of flesh out that, kind of, that, that flesh out those ideas and see they can see where we, we're coming from with the talks. They should be sort of uh, fairly fairly obvious I hope. Um, the four talks are in kind of chronological order. Um, the first one Steve Mills will be talking about are the kings and colliers, a barbarous and ungovernable people. Apparently I think Steve will explain that to you later on. So that's the first talk. Um, secondly, then I'll be talking to a talk called um, From Peterloo to Captain Swing, uh, Victims or Insurgents, looking at 19th century radical histories and critiquing them. Thirdly, uh, Annie Cullen over there will be doing a, a history of the, the suffragettes, or part of the suffragette movement, a movement for enfranchisement of women. Um, and she's looking, it's called Votes for Ladies, the suffragette movement from 1903 to 1914. 
And lastly, uh, Rich Rose, sitting behind the computer, will be doing a talk called My Holiday Snaps, which is about the enclosures in India and his experiences when he travelled there the early, a few years ago. So they're the four talks. Um, we'll have bits of discussion after them, and then we'll have breaks, and hopefully we won't tire ourselves out and fall asleep. And I'll hand over to Steve. Thank you very much. before I get into the history where we actually are situated within the United Kingdom. As you can see, London's here, Scotland where it rains a lot is up there, and Bristol is here, right on the Seven Channel. And you can see, as we spoke about the slave trade, what an important port it would have been for the hinterlands of the United Kingdom. Bristol, in the period I was speaking about, which is the 18th century, was the second largest city in the UK. In economic importance as well as population, not only in the slave trade, Bristol was prominent in the sugar industry, armaments industry, shipbuilding, um, a whole host of things. And one of, one of the biggest um, coal industries, one of, one of the biggest influences on Bristol was a very large coal field that was situated on, which we're going to see any second now. I thought you were on to that. No, coal field, please, Sorry, mate. Okay, the, king, the Kingsman Forest, which I'm going to speak about today, is where this coal field is situated. It's the red here. So if you remember, Bristol's here, it is the Seven Channel. And there is the Kingswood coal field. Back again, right? See, we've got other large coal fields here, but this coal field here actually supported Bristol in its early industrial development. It was very important for the coal, uh, sorry, for the glass making, for the brass industry, but, and the cannons that were made in Bristol were ships all over the world. The Kingswood Forest here was also, as the name suggests, a massive area of woodland. Um, this was demised over the period I'm going to be talking about, because once again, as I said, shipbuilding, a lot of the actual uh, trees were cut down before the shipbuilding. But I'm going to jump back in time now to the time of William the Bastard, as he was known by his contemporaries, or William the Conqueror, more likely known in today's history books. As you know, he landed around here in 1066 with his mercenary army and quickly spread over the country. In 1087, he got the Doomsday Book together. And the important thing about the Doomsday Book in British culture, it passed the land off. People started to own land. Just about everything, every, every sheep, field, was documented for the purpose of taxation and also state control. But another important thing, all the, all the forests and there's Kingswood Forest here, there's Chatham up here, there's got lots of different forests, but Crown property, made right? Crown property. And one of the most important things about this is it became like, I suppose, a, a holiday park for the monarchs. They could go down there, they could travel out with all their courtiers and such like, and go hunting for game. And what I mean by game, I mean deer, mainly. And they would hunt the game, they would set up wardens and look after the game during the, when the king wasn't there, or queen, whatever. Right? And basically, they would keep an eye on the forest to make sure it was well stocked with game and it was you know, in good order. But as you can see, I mean, the coal field roughly is around the size of the forest. It's a large expanse of land. And we've all heard about like, people in history, like Robin Hood, for example. It was a magnet for outlaws. You know, if you, if you were outlaws from the legal system, for one reason or another, a lot of people would escape to the forests to meet the like-minded people, and they would squat the land there. Now, squatting is very interesting. Um, have you all heard about common land? Do you know what I'm speaking about? I speak about common land. Basically, it's, it's still own land, but it was land that wasn't actually utilised by, by the ruling class of that particular area, and people could utilise the stuff on the, on the land for whole various reasons. They could take woods for building, and for, for fuel, etc., get berries, they could um, graze their sheep or their oxen or their horses on there. But one of the most important things that I've found about common land, that's a very quick synopsis, by the way. There's lots and lots of books written about common land. But one, one of the most important things about it is a lot of it was handed down from generation by word of mouth. It's not a great deal written down about it. But one of the most important things I feel about common land is the people who actually worked and used the commons held the key to sustainability. So, for example, if you suddenly brought a couple of new cows and you wanted to graze them on the common land, you might be refused for the simple reason 
that it would not be able to sustain those extra cans that were thrown on the way down. And that is something I believe that we've lost in the current, current age, and that's what we need to be So I would shift all that. Another interesting thing about the common land is the one day house. Has anybody ever heard about the one day house? Thank you, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> He's been to other talks before. The one day house, um, I read about this first off from an anarchist historian, Colin Ward, who writes a lot about um, housing and such like. And once again, it, it, there's evidence of this in Peru, um, Italy, South Wales, but also Kingswood. And it's not written down anywhere. And there's differing. Um, different ideas around the rights to it, but in Kingswood, if you could get a structure up, four walls and smoke coming out of the chimney of the hearth, and um, between dusk to dawn, then you could claim that land. Now evidently, what you would need, you, you would need some sort of community help there, you could not, it would be physically impossible for you to build some structure in that period of time, this is very small, I suppose, unless you can stand up here. So you get all your mates to come down, your family, your lineage, for the next slide to come out. Um, your lineage will come and help you. This is a map of Kingswood Forest. And all these places here are all little spotted cottages. Could you enlarge please, guys? And I'll just like, I mean, we've got the names here, and there's a couple we can pick out. Sam and Thomas Potter, for example. We've got the stones dotted around here, it's edge of stone up here, sandstone here, jazz stone here. So you can see there's, there's evidence of lineage. I mean, in fact, if you have a good look at this, which I have, there's, there's the fries up here, for example, there might be some fries up there. They're, they're dotted about. But another very um, interesting thing about the common land, sorry, about the one day house, is one of my favourite stories, how you actually claim the land around it that you can work. And one of, the, one of the stories I have heard is what you would do, I mean, don't forget all your mates to turn up, you build this house, you drink inside as you build it, and you open it. And you go to the walls, and you went like that, you can rest during the night. But at the, in the morning, what you do is clean the ledge, you stand with your back to the wall, you get an axe, and you throw it. And as far as you could throw it, you'd mark out your land around. <coughs> you can imagine the range of the forest trotting along the Azores. Here's this noise, it comes around the corner. And there's all this gang of people, and now it's a sunny pops out of nowhere. Shall I say something? Then you notice there's some bloke from the accident with all these drunken mates. Well, I think you would just probably move on. <laughs> um, which brings me to the next point. I mean, as you know, the English Revolution in 1649, where we locked Charlie's head off, Charlie Stewart, and um, the Crown lost authority with it. Evidently, there was the, um, the military the tank ship with major generals, and once again, they were speeding through this. But like, um, when, when the monarchy was, was reasserted on us in 1660, one of the first things that Charles II and Charlie Stuart II wanted was to reassert his authority. And we had this bright idea of coming up to Kingswood and reasserting his authority up there, as in other forests. But Kingswood had developed a lot. I mean, I found evidence of Scotland going back to 1585. There was probably Scots before that, but that was when I first found written records of the Bristol records. But, of course, after the English Civil War, there was a lot of discontent, the New World Army, the Burford um, um, uprising, the Putney debates. A lot of the New World Army were wondering what on earth they fought for, you know, where's the money, a lot of money being paid. And I suppose some of you know, unfortunately, I mean, this is, this is a stain on our history, is a lot of the army were transported over to Ireland, where they fought in Cromwell's armies, the Massacre of Drogdera, and such like, you know, where they got the land in part payment for wages. But a lot of them shipped out from Bristol, now there's no doubt that a lot of them left there, deserted, didn't fancy anyone, they had enough, had enough for them. And I believe the spotting did take off, a lot of them ended up up here. There was already settlements up here, I think a lot of them came up here. I mean the Kings of Forest was still very big, but uh, there's a lot of room for them to move into. And um, in 1670, after the King the second, Charles II reasserted, or tried to reassert his authority, he sent a few people up to reassert the authority over, over the forest. And um, one thing about, well, I'll go on to the, the rights in a minute, but they, obviously the sponsors didn't want this authority, they were quite happy living where they wanted. But there's a very funny story, which I love this one. He had this bright idea about these fellows. He thought, I know what I'll do is reassert the king's authority. I restock the forest with game. So he got six, no, he got 12 deers, six stags, six hinds, and let them go. So off they tried, 
And two days later, he came back. I'm surprised, surprised, they're all gone. Mm. You know, they've all been eaten. The ones who haven't eaten have fallen down coal miners, you know? It's a bit like throwing pork pies at striking miners. Well, this will get rid of them. You know, it just didn't work, it just didn't work. And um, in 1670, then tried force. And um, they were big and comprehensively. And after that, until the periods I'm going to talk about in the mid 18th century, there was no, there was no royal authority on here. You see, um, the liberties here, I'm not going to go too much about this. For all intents and purposes, these were big squatters. These were people who sort of had rough ownership. I mean, there was legal battles going on right up to the 19th, 20th, 20th century over some of the land holdings here. These people were squatted. They also allowed other squatters, secondary squatters, and such like. Now, I spoke about um, the, the benefits of the common land, you know, grazing animals and such like. One of the most important things about the Forest, I'm going to talk about the miners, was the coal. So, not only could they get the wood and such like, but they would start digging. I've heard of some mining companies in terms of the next slide. So, just, and literally, these, these mines, you know, I mean, we see the modern day mine, these were just holes in the ground. I don't know if you've ever heard of bell pits, where they sort of literally cut them down. They're very, very basic. I mean, in Kingsville, they did have more developed pits. And getting back to the liberties as well, there, was, there were lots of different arrangements. Sometimes you just get a family, or perhaps two families, just dig down to the ground. Sometimes they would find it difficult to finance this, to somebody would buy the rights off of them or something, you know, and then they get together. So there were big landowners, if you like, not landowners, big interests running several mines and developing them on the capitalist recruits and Cuba's principles. And there was the smaller holdings. The smaller holdings are the ones I'm more interested in. And we can see evidence here, like, you know, what all this is, it's just a hole in the ground. You can see the blood working there. The, the, the coals come up, and it's a lot deeper than that. It's the, what's known as the pit heads. And up here, they're bringing the coal, and they're, they're loading up the coal wagons. So that'll be shipped into Bristol. Some of it go to Bath, some of it go onto the canal, perhaps go into South Wales and such like before the big pits in South Wales. But also, we see on this picture here, it's a bit more well dressed, and he's probably buying the bulk at the pit heads before it gets to market. Um, now, my very, very dangerous job. I mean, that goes without saying, I suppose, but uh, I believe it also brought together an essence of community. And I'm just going to talk about one, uh, one disaster that happened in 1753. Basically, it was a, um, a, a medium-sized pit that was being worked, and somehow we don't actually know what happened, but water was struck, and the, the, the wall of the pit broke down, and the water just flooded through, and the vast majority of the miners were swept away never to be found again. But four people, could you go on a little bit to where, it's, where the different levels are? Here we go, that back again, because I'm like, that's it. Right, so it could be some place, you can see people working at different levels here, and there's the, the highest seam up here. And what happens was, is some of the people, four, actually managed to get up here, and they got away from it. They, they stayed there for eight days and eight nights. Now, um, this, this is quite famous in Kingsborough history, because all the local mines, Stopped work and didn't work for eight days, so they didn't get any money for eight days while they stayed there and tried to get their comrades out. They would not leave them down there until they were certain they were dead. And eight days down there, I mean, you can see that all they got to candles, you know, they've been pitch black. I mean, there's stories they actually ate a basket, there's a pannier basket made out of a, you know, reeds. They actually had to eat that, they had to drink their own urine and such like. The youngest down there was a 10 year old boy, the oldest was a 73 year old bloke. A 73, I just took the last of 73 at that direction, it was an amazing achievement. And eventually they, they, um, they, they lowered down the brazier that, that drew the, the black cloud, the black down is sort of like a gas that sort of it, it, it noxious, but it is noxious. I mean, they also, like, uh, they, they couldn't get down there, they this through the black cloud. They were left, they got down there, they got their comrades up, and they had a big celebration, they collected together 25 pounds, and that is an astronomical amount for the welfare of these four people because they've gone blind. They, they, were, they were in a dodgy state, actually. But not only but with this community, there's also you know, a strength of wider community, a sense of wider community as well. And as I said about the 1670 riots, about squatting men, you know, if they felt they were being down, done down, they would act, react sorry, with extreme violence at times. And the barbers and government, uh, the barbers and government people, comes from a line of historian Malcolm uh, Williamson, Malcolmson, William Malcolmson, who wrote it in, uh, in um, oh, 1980, I think, 1985. 
And I basically, this was a quote from the Methodists, I'll talk about the Methodists in a minute. But the people in the forest have seen it as completely and utterly outside of normal society. If you like. But that was a two sided sword as well, because the kings with miners felt that they had nothing to do with the people of Bristol, the people of Bristol, other than to sell them the car. If anybody heard the turnpikes, you, know, you obviously know tolls, and there's a big one on the Lincoln Bridge in there if you want to get out of the city. Similar thing. In the, in, in the period I'm talking about, before the Highways Association or whatever, you know, local landowners, they had roads going through their, their land. They used to put up ta- toll gates for the, for the purpose, basically, of raising money to keep the roads up, up to scratch, up to standards. It didn't always work like that when they used to pocket it. But these toll gates were put up on the roads from Kingsford into Bristol and also into Bath. Now, the, there was, um, they, the Kingswood miners would have to pay to get into Bristol. So therefore, whatever, and there was, they didn't make a lot of money, even though it was a very dangerous, dirty, horrible job, you know, they didn't get a lot of money out of it. So any extra on their overheads with taking the money, <coughs> excuse me, taking the um, coal into uh, Bristol would have affected the negative. So I'm not more, excuse me. It was only a penny, but if you're taking several loads of coal over the week into that's going to really not be on. So in 1729, there was large turnpike lights. And basically, they, what there would be, there would be a booth on one side. There'd be, depending on, on the area, a couple of people in there. There'd be a uh, barrier, sort of a chain or something across the road. When somebody came up, they'd pay the money, up go the barrier, in they went. The kings would mind us, attack these toll gates, Built a big bonfire, set fire, went up again. The authorities rebuilt it, they did it again and again and again. <coughs> now, they were successful because in the end, they stopped trying to put turnpikes on the road from Kingswood to Bristol. And also, after these events in 1729, the state actually made a capital offence, therefore they could hang you by your neck for destroying the turnpike. So, therefore, I think that proves by the effect. <coughs> That their actions did actually was actually successful, but unfortunately they weren't always successful. <coughs> As I said, there's different um, different sort of types of mine. And some of the big mine owners who brought together a lot of little mines, brought them out, employed what employed the labourers and such like. In 1738, they tried to drive down wages to make themselves more competitive with some of the smaller mines. And obviously what they had here was what they would do if they would force down the wages, they'd be able to sell their coal cheaper, they'd undercut the smaller mines, <coughs> therefore bringing in, forcing the smaller mines out of business, and therefore they'd have to sell up or just leave it, and the bigger luck mine, the mine owners would bring them into their fold, if you like. So what the miners did, this is one of the biggest rights in the 18th century, in the country, not just in Bristol, in the country, Kings of the miners all got up. They went to these unpopular pits where the, pit, where the mine owners had put up, put up the way, put down the way, just sorry. They broke the pit heads, the wind machines, and this cost a lot of money. There was a lot of capitalist money in these. And they just made sure all the other miners were down, down below the low ground, not up. <coughs> and then they threw the, threw the machine down, therefore destroying that pit for a good many years. Because not only could they not get coal up, they would have to get down there somehow and clear the rubble out before they can even work the scene again. And then amusingly enough, they then went onto the main road to Bristol and set up the Romans hold gun mm-hmm. and started, well they all went on strike, everybody went on strike. So they set up a strike front to where the toll gates, they took at least out the capsules books if you like, you know. Word as it, they let, they let the common person pass, but anybody with a horse or a bit of wealth, they would tax them. Tax popping there, I think. This was working, but they felt they had to increase the strikes. They moved to Bustleton, as it was called then, now Brisbane, which is another coal, coal field, just south of the sea, because Kingswood is, is east, small things, north south, and they started going around the mines there, and started encouraging their comrades there to lay down their tunnels and join in with the strike. Some of the miners at Bustleton did, some didn't, and they had to have it all. Should we say, a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of physical encouragement to down to get up and come in. And then they marched into Bristol. 
they marched into Bristol and on the way they thought they'd visit a few owl houses just to you know, have a little drink, a bit of Dutch courage we call it in England. And as they did this, they basically went to each owl house and it wasn't very nice to the landlord or landlady, you know, they, they bundled in the kitchen, ate everything that wasn't nailed down, drunk everything and then went to the next one. And at the end of the day, they, they actually went into Bristol or in the centre of Bristol for one day. They controlled the streets for all sets and purposes. The, the local authorities withdrew and eventually they withdrew. And they were partly successful. And the, the, a lot of the mine owners withdrew their ideas on cutting wages. And the sort of, the, there was a sense of uneasy calm. The, there's three types of rights, actually, I should have said this at the beginning, there's three types of rights that are very um, prominent in British history of this period of time, the turnpike rights being one of them, the other one being sort of early proto-industrial sort of wage disputes and stuff like this, but the other one is what E.P. Thompson calls the moral economy, and this is what I'm going to speak about next, this is um, price rights, if you like, bread, potatoes, that sort of thing. There's a lot of history in England of, and it was mainly women, which is very interesting, I think, would go into a market, they would go up to a, a, a baker that just put their prices up, seize loads of bread, sell it at what they would perceive as being a fair price, which was more than likely the price that was before, and then return the empty sacks that held the bread back to the uh, proprietor and give them at times the money back. So it's quite an organised riot in that way, but it was sort of saying, that's enough, we're not paying any more. And this happened in Bristol on several occasions. But in 1740, there was, there was a big dearth, there was the end of the Seven Years' War, of course, stuff like that. And um, there was starvation in England. And the Kingswood miners decided that enough was enough. And they were going to walk into Bristol and lower the price of bread by force. Now, have you, have you all heard of the Methodists? Charles Wesley and all that? Yeah, it's what we... They were all over Kingswood like, like a plague at this time. They arrived in 1738. Now, the thing about Wesleyanism, or Methodism, was they were very prominent, weren't they, in the sort of developing world, they sent uh, missionaries out, well, out here, actually, <laughs> not quite here, but not, uh, Africa and other sort of places, but one of the places they really concentrated on in England was Kingswood. They felt that was a perfect place to take their word, you know, that God loves us all, and there's, there's a, a, a story of, um, it's funny enough, it's a West Indian cricket club now, but Rose Green, there's this hill by Kingswood, and um, Charles Wesley was meant to have spoken on there in 1739 to 20,000 people without a public address system. I find that a bit dubious. There were stories that when he told the miners that Jesus loves them at all as well, of like streaks of, with the tears of going through their cold, um, cold days, thus faces. But like, there's, there's both sides to that. I mean, there's, there's certainly, I don't know if you've read E.P. Thompson's uh, Make an English Working Class in there, he argues that perhaps Methodism sort of hived off the revolutionary spirit of the working class in this, in this period of the time. And unfortunately there's evidence of this in the 1740 bread riots. Because a whole host of the kingdom, everybody down tools, the whole area just down tools and started marching into Bristol. And Wesley headed them off with some of the Methodists, spoke to them, encouraged them not to riot, that it was against God's work. And he took a deputation to meet the mayor. And the deputation was made up of like, older men, women, yeah, they, so they didn't look sort of too violent, if you like, took the sting out of it. They went into the mayor's chambers, doffed their caps, explained that they, they, their families were starving, the price of bread had forced them into this position, and <coughs> they wanted him to do something. He promised, promised them faithfully that he would do them proud, he would see them good, and they went back to the forest, and he didn't do a great deal. I mean, there was a bit of paternalism after that, you know, so they set up soup kitchens, there was um, collections and such like. And one of the things I found absolutely amazing is one of the things they did do is they sent coal back into Kingswood, which speak, well, it speaks volumes in the way, because a lot of people must have lost that mode of production to the larger scale capitalists who were bringing it into Bristol, and it had to come back out into Kingswood so they could actually heat their cottages. Um, in 1753, there was another period of dearth, and once again the kings of colliers rose up, and um, this time they didn't listen to the Methodists. They thought, you know, it didn't work last time. Our children were starving, and they're going in. But unfortunately, they were, the, the local authorities were tipped off, and they were waiting for them. And um, six people were shot, 
there, there's stories of like all the kings were colleagues coming in at different gates because Bristol at the time, or, uh, even though after the Civil War the castle was blown up and all that, I don't know much about Bristol during the Civil War. Um, but there used to be there used to be a walled city basically. And there were still several gates, the main thoroughfares into the city, and the kings and colleagues once again went round to the south to talk to some of their comrades from the south, southern coal fields. And they marched in like this. And there's stories of the women with their aprons where they gather in stones to come in to sort of smash the windows off the council house and such like. But the authorities have raised the, um, the hue and cry and they were waiting for them with ball and musket and pick them off and, and run them off. And, and there was a couple of days of, of fighting going back and forwards, back and forwards. Uh, four co colliers lost their life. And a very, this is very interesting, actually, a very um, unpopular um, bloke. He was also involved in um, the wage dispute at Blackwood Feature. Um, was chasing the colliers um, with his gun. He got a little bit overexcited for himself, got carried away. And they caught him, they disarmed him. And they took him back and held him hostage. They didn't hurt him. You know, they could have, they could have really done him grief. And they, he wasn't popular, he wasn't a nice bloke by any stretch of the imagination for our side of things. But they let him go. They didn't, they didn't pay a ransom, they let him go. And they hoped that would also show that they, their, their, their cause was right, if you like. They'd been forced into this, this violent confrontation with the local authorities and they needed to be fed. Once again, not a great deal ha they all happened out of it, but one thing that I did think was very important was 29 people got taken to Assizes and rioting in this day and age was a one-way ticket to the hangman's notes. But all 29 were, were, well, some of them were acquitted, the majority of them were acquitted, but not a single one of them were hung. Some of them were transported for seven years. Probably, probably to America, actually, at that time. Um, that's, that's about all I'm going to say now about the lights, but there's one other one I'm going to wind up, wind up with a funny one. And that's one of the darkest ideas of all the state have ever had in this period. They thought they'd have this side tax. They would try it once again, I mean, you know what it's like with taxation, they, they get themselves in some stupid war or something, they can't afford to pay for it. So they expect us not to pay for it by tax to it, taxing what we enjoy. And I don't know if any of you have been to the West Country, but we like our side. You know, and it's a big thing as well, and like um, also the agricultural tradition around harvest time, you do the harvest and then you'd have a pint, so you'd be part paid with cider. I spoke earlier about the one day house, you know, you'd be building the house and you'd cough with cider at the time, you know. In other cities in, in England, it was more like small beer and such like that. So it's very important. And they put this tax in it, which basically meant that it was, it was, it would price out the, the common man out of his favourite tipple. And they sent these customers and excise officers up to Kingsford. So they must not have read the small print on where they were going. It's probably the daftest job they'd ever, they'd ever tried to do. And the Kingsford colleagues greeted and called them, um, lowered them down the pit, and promised to let them back up again when they stopped being so silly. And um, <laughs> after a short period of time, they promised not to be so silly. So they brought them back up again, charged them for bed and breakfast, and sent them on their merry way. <laughs> and three years later, the side attacks was, um, was, was dropped. Um, the, the back of the Kingsford Colliers and the Kingsford Forest, unfortunately, was broken after the Napoleonic War. Um, there was, um, as you know, there was a big, there was a big war in, uh, in Europe. Um, but at the end of it, in 1815, the British Army was demobilised. As I said earlier, Bristol was a big area for um, the armaments industry. So there was, a, there was a lot of push-pull factors, if you like, a lot of people were getting laid off. And at the same time, a lot of fit soldiers were coming back looking for work. So there was a lot of trouble in Bristol and, and lots of other cities within the area in England. But one of the things that happened was, was the Kingswood Colliers, and also there was a very important um, criminal gang that, that I'd like to speak about another day, but not today, I think, called the Cock Road Gang, that were basically a very, very organised criminal gang that had links in London, right up as far as Arrowford, Cheltenham, all over the place where they were steel horses, some and such like. And then once again, they were on lineage terms, but like the authorities got together and they brought together the Kingswood Association, which was basically a militia based on, um, on the ruling classes, you know. They, they got the militia from other parts of Bristol and the um, civil war occurred up in, in the Kingswood Forest from 1817 to 1822, basically. A lot of people were killed. Um, it was um, in line with the poaching disputes. They would break into people's houses <coughs> on the basis of accusing them of poaching, looking for guns and nets and snares. A lot of people were transported, and the area, I would like to say pacified, but things changed. Shortly after that, the poor law, the new poor law was brought in, <coughs> and one of the saddest points is like, 
And not anybody was in the seat of Paul or in Kings would have to, had to wear like a red cross on their chest. You know, so, so everybody knew they were in the seat of Paul or they were shamed into it. At the same time, schools were being built up there for the promotion of Christian knowledge, in other words, work life discipline. And um, also, there was the workouts, up there, as I said, and churches started to mushroom, not just the wastelands and such like. And another thing, that, like with the shipbuilding and such like, it wasn't really a forest, it was a forest only in, in name. A lot of it was very urbanised, as it is now. If you saw Kingston Forest now, you'd be very lucky to find a tree, actually. Mm -hmm. you know? But I think that's all I'm going to say, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions if there are any. Because, like, I'm really excited you're here presenting, but because I don't really have much of a knowledge of how much of this is known in Bristol. Very good. Yeah, I, I, could you just discuss that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's part of the, the random history tradition. Yeah, that's part of the, 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 the hidden histories. Yeah. Um, one, one of our comrades, is, she's also a trade union comrade, and she works at the Central Reference Library. And you ring her up and you say you want a book, and like, you turn up, she's got 12, and, and she's very helpful. And you go through. Um, you go for the newspapers, it's on microfilms the newspapers and such like, which is very much the ruling class perception of it. But also there was um, um, documentaries, there was, a, there was a Reverend Ellicott, for example, and he got to, he was there in the 19th century, he got press cuttings from the time, also got squatters this and such like, so that's held in the Bristol Records office. And that's a good start. And like, you, you, you've just got to dig, it, it takes a lot, a lot of time, I mean, I remember I had this bright idea, I, I got this idea that there was a family of Keynes, C-A-I-N-E-S, Mark of Keynes, another book that's probably going to come out soon about the Cock Road Gang. And I thought, I wonder if there's still some living in, in Kingsford. So I went to the phone book, opened it up, and there's Keynes everywhere. You know, so the family's still there. But there's a Kingsford Historical Association, they don't really talk about the writing or anything like that. You know, it's very, it's very one-sided. Um, I talked about uh, Malcolmson earlier. He's about the only historian who's done anything on the Kingswood Mine. Well, he started the Kingswood Mine, if you like. They've popped up in other books since. You know, but it, it, it takes some digging. Bob Malcolmson. Right? Pardon? Bob Malcolmson. That's right, yeah. Yeah, in, uh, yeah. in Canada. Is he Canadian? Yeah. I don't believe that. Yes. Yeah. Who made this happen? Pardon me? Who made this happen? I'm not too sure where these came from. These all come from the Get Back to Dawn, Dawn Diary at the Central um, Reference Library. She got these, and she also got the copyrights on Groves and She also sorted out the copyrights for this as well. They come from old sketches from the time. And I have to be honest, most of these are sort of more early 19th century as opposed to some other. The bell bits are more common. The reason it's gone is, could you flick onto the next one? This, this, this is French. <laughs> this is complete with a black, I'm afraid. But it does show the different levels. You know, where you see the housing up there, they come down, you know, he's working a bit there, he's working a bit there, they're putting up. This is quite a large mine and such like. So they're all, all the, what I'm trying to say is what I've got here has been cobbled together from a lot of different sources about general mining, if you like, that I've tacked on to Keto Mine to give us a rough idea of what it could have been like. You know, once again, back to, going back to the disaster, you can picture that, you know, if water was hit here, it would have been second. This stuff, you know, the only open door is to be here quick. But um, I mean, there, there is quite a bit. I mean, um, there's the big South Wales coal fields, and there's the big coal fields up north. And I think a lot more history has been written about um, mining, early mining up there. But the Kingswood miners, or free miners, though, but more, and there's a pamphlet at the back actually about the Forest of Dean about the three miners are there, and that's once again is another forest, where it's very similar to what I'm talking about here, where literally you can, you can squat the land, over a period of time you can, you can claim common rights, and you just duck down until you hit coal. And when you passed on, it's sudden to take it over. You know, it, was, it was a patriarchal society, obviously. Mm -hmm. you uh, Steve, thank you very much for uh, a really f a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Very, uh, very lively. Good. Filled with spirit, made Good. made it all alive again. You know, alive. Yeah. Really, really great. And uh, but since since I was in Bristol last, something has occurred to me about 
the Kingswood uh, Miners. It's not far from Somerset, is that right? That, that's, that's a good point. It's in Somerset. That's and you had the point. levels there, eh? Yeah. Now, I was reading, because here in America we're very uh, exercised about the origins of the earth okay. and whether God did it or whether it came some other way. And, you know, Darwin and the geologists, they have their theory, but then a lot of people in the States say, no, God did it like that. But I think those coal miners, they knew something because they were going under into the ground. And I think they were the scientists, in a way, I'm speaking uh, a bit broadly now, they were the scientists who found the, might have found the fossils, eh? And then who begin to teach the first underground geologists of England. You know, the first underground map was 1801 right. of the different... Uh, but I think that this must have occurred to miners, right? Met long before it did to the scientists. So I just wanted to ask, um, you know, as you're doing your investigations, to bear in mind that in addition to struggling against inhumane conditions, these people were going, you know, into the, the devil's underground and seeing it and finding seashells or finding, you know, the evidence of creatures from different, different um, horizons of the history of the earth itself. My understanding is that actually happening in South Wales. I, I don't have found any evidence in Bristol. I, I have heard, and I'm, I'm not sure where I've heard it, I'd like to put a hand up for it, but I can't unfortunately, but South Wales miners were at, did actually find some stuff and did call geologists in, you know, to explain, to, for them to explain to the miners what it was as well. But it's funny about you said about the bowels of the earth as well, I mean that was something else that was felt by the Bristolians and the wider community, is they, they were digging in hell. <laughs> you know, they, they, they were going, right down into, into the bowels of the earth. And that couldn't be good. That couldn't be good for you, no way about it. It's also interesting, Peter, that about Somerset and Gloucester as well. And I get back to the criminal gangs and such like. It's Kingswood, it's, a, it's Bridges, Somerset, Gloucester, and of course the city and county of Bristol, because we had a chart in 30 or 43 that make this big. They're not un unique, but there's about, only about three or four cities, I think, in, in Britain that is a county and a city. So basically what they could do is they could get up to no good in Somerset and quickly jot over the, over the border to Gloucestershire and the authorities in Somerset and Gloucestershire and Bristol didn't go on with each other. And like there was no sort of jurisdiction. So that also helped, especially in the later period in the struggle, for them to sort of nip across the border. And that also made the area quite infamous. I'm sorry, I don't know much about the seashells or anything like that, but I will keep my eyes open for it. If I, Roger. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say a, a sycophantic kind of way that um, this point's really interesting yeah, because yeah. Um, last, when we were doing work on enclosure in 2008, one of the things we did was to go to a free mine in the Forest of Dean. So if you look on this map, this is another area which has free mining rights. It's just up there in sort of across the, across the Seven Estuary. Oh, what God. was really interesting was so this is this is like, there is, as, as Steve mentioned, there's still free mines existing. So, for example, we went to this mine, and there's a 72-year-old miner and his brothers and friends who still, you know, dug this mine themselves. And it, when I say a free mine, it's like you do have the right if you were born, you have to be born in the Forest of Dean in this area, and um, you also have to work for one year and a day in a mine. And then once you've done that, you can dig a mine. You can just literally go into the Forest of Dean and dig a mine, which is very strange. So those common rights still exist. So we went to this mine. And this is 72 year old bloke who takes us down into this pit, right? So we're all wandering down and we've got our little hats on. But what, what came across to me, and this is what ties up with what Peter's saying, is, is I was amazed by the absolute complexity of knowledge and te technology that, was, that these miners knew about. Okay, so we walked down the tunnel, and there's like all these different bits of iron and wood, and, and they all have different names you've never heard of in your life. So it was like, you know, I can't even remember all the names now, but there were so many different bits of technology they were talking about. They knew exactly how to like, because actually mines start to close up when you build them. So floors lift and you know, all these techniques for dealing with those things, for dealing with gases, for dealing with water. And, and they literally every an hour talking in technology. And it came across straight away that these weren't people who had been trained in any way by any kind of 
you know, they didn't work for the national car board in you know, prior to privatisation. They didn't. They didn't have come through that background at all. They come through traditions of digging these mines for hundreds of years, and the technology was deeply complex. It was like, I mean, I just thought we just dig a hole. I mean, Steve's also saying they don't hold, but that was developed. That technology was developed for the process of actually learning and death yeah. and injury and all sorts of other things with incredible knowledge, right? and it works. I mean, they, they were able to dig these mines without heavy machinery. You know, we still they were deep mines as well. It seems, and, and what I think the point is, what we're making is, is that through that knowledge, actual you know, the, the process of digging stuff, they would have come across things like fossils. Or they would have understood things like strapping and strata and stratification of rocks and folding and all sorts of other things. They had their own, their own words for that and they had their own way of understanding that, which may not have been the same for scientists, but it's absolutely true that scientists would have been the people, they would have gone straight to them to talk to these people because they had the experience of Shah. What about that? Yeah, um, I may have a lot of questions, but one of them is more maybe will help orient all of us possibly because you gave a kind of overview of a history that you're looking into, and I'm curious what part of it right is most resonant for you in terms of thinking about the present. You know, in terms of well, that's a good one. I'm, I have to I do a lot about social crime about the law and where it came from, so like, you know, going back to William the Bastard and all that, you know, and how our rights have been usurped over a period of time, and we lost contact with the land, the commons and stuff like that. But it came from Kingswood, I mean, Kingswood was one of the first things that tickled my fancy, if you like. And that's, because um, I'm a Londoner, but I've moved to Bristol now. And uh, I read about them, got involved, as I said, I went to, I went to the records office and such like that, they just sprung up at me. I'm also interested in writing, actually, a bit so the disobedience, I think it's good for the soul man, you know, the you know, moral economy and stuff like that, you know. But I, I think that's, for, for me, that's, that's one of the big things. And over a period of time, you know, the time wage capitalism and such like that, maybe we've lost contact of our lands, we, we, you know, the enclosure acts and such like that, moved into the factories, you know, the, um, the industrialisation, the mechanisation of our labour and how the, you know, the threshing machine could have meant that we would only do a two day week. But in fact, what we do is lots of people lose their jobs and one person does a five-day week, you know. It, it doesn't make anything easy for us. All it makes is um, you know, more money for the capitalists, you know. That, that sort of process ongoing. And it's how we address that. Um, another thing I'm really interested in is, is the English Revolution. You know, where the, uh, the start of printing presses, where people start to read the Bible for themselves, if you like. You know. I mean, I'm not religious in any stretch, I'm an atheist, but like, at that time you actually understand that you know, the Bible was the, the big book, it was the book. And people started to read it and it said that the earth was a common treasury, it should be held for all. And they started to question the ruling classes and their rights to hold this. That sort of stuff is what really floats my boat. Makes me inside. You were very good today. <laughs> yeah, that's the sort of thing that really interests me. And I do think it has a direct link with what we've got at the moment. I mean, some of the things that Mr. Radical History have done, we were speaking last night, uh, we, we held a seminar on the miners' strike, and then we had another seminar afterwards about um, coal, class, and climate, and about um, green, um, sorry, clean coal and the technology around it, you know, and, and we juxtaposed those. So I suppose that's one of the ways you can bring it into the future, if you like. Another one is the enclosures and the uh, pamphlet at the back about brewing your own beer from nettles. You know, because the enclosure acts, they, they industrialised, they started to grow hops, made beer as we know it now, when in the old days we, we, we sort of got stuff from the fields, from, from the commons, made beer ourselves. You know, there'd been a cottage industry where somebody would have made the beer, we would all sat around and drunk the beer. You know, so, like alienation labour, stuff like that. So I'm going on now. Anything else, please? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I've got one more. I just have a, I have a question that uh, I am interested in this idea of the moral economy too, and just something yeah. that, maybe, that you're talking to me to think about is um, how I've got to believe there's like a much different relationship with debt and with the threat of the hangman uh, in, the, in the context you're talking about than like how we think about debt and like fear of dying today. And I just wonder if you have any like thoughts uh, you've come across or if you have any like ideas about what what that risk meant to a provider or to a coal miner. One of our next projects is there's a lot of riots in English history where um, the rioters dress up as women. 
and uh, I'm going to get up with all sorts of questions by the government. And we believe there's several reasons, and Roger and I are going to work on this in the future. The Luddites, for example, the Rebecca riots, and there were times that the kings were minors were dressed up as women as well. There's a whole thing about the carnival, you know, coming out, you know, the fancy dress, the fancy dress riot, if you like. Some people think it might be that. Other people might, might have thought that, you know, around the moral economy, that the, the women used to go out as well, you know, they were like supporting the, the femininity of the, of the domestic. I'm not too sure about that. I think another reason is the militia would find it very difficult to fire on women. Oh, sorry, there was disguise. Disguise was another one, sorry. But the militia would find it very difficult to fire on women. So therefore, if they all dressed in women's clothes, the militia might fire high. Now, what was the thoughts of hanging? I mean, we, we've done some work on hanging as well, and there's some people that stand on the scaffold and make brave speeches around poaching and such like, saying, you know, I wouldn't be here if I could feed my family. You know, and it is as basic as that, you know. I either watch my kids die or I'd get out there and do something about it. And at the end of the day, you know, it's a horrible death hang, you know, other than burning crap, so you know, I can't think of a worse way, you know. So I, I think I think at the end of the day it was a deterrent. Oh there's no way it actually it's very interesting. Tyburn, where they used to have the hangings in London, yeah, the big area outside Newgate Nick, sorry, Newgate Jail. <laughs> and I used to Pull them out there, and, and it was a big public spectacle. I spent most of the red green mission for car, but the public spectacle and such like, you know. And they'd hang pickpockets, for example. You know, people used to come up and nick it out of pockets. Now, it used to get big crowds, all sorts of people. They'd be ragamuffins selling the apples and such like, you know. But they'd, they'd be the, the great and powerful coming there to see the great unwashed getting their just desserts as they saw it getting hung. But there was large instances of pickpocketing. You know, so there's someone being hung up there as a deterrent for having their pockets picked. And at the same time, other, the rich were getting their pockets picked. So it obviously wasn't that much, much of a deterrent. I mean, there's also other things where there was riots at hangings. And there was also riots after the hangings, because sometimes the, the dead were handed over to surgeons. A lot of our medical knowledge now is gathered from the medical profession who, who took the cavities after the hanging, opened them up. And like, you know, if your mate had just been hung, you didn't want to hand over to the surgeon because there's issues about the sun and such like. Um, I'm going to jump a little bit to the pillory as well. Do you know the pillory, the stocks? Yeah. Oh yes, thank you. It's pillory. <laughs> what, what was pillory for <laughs> The stocks, yeah. So you stick your head in like this and like, I mean some of those are getting really nasty. There's, there's an incident in 1822 with a thief taker, which basically is a bailiff or a deputy you used to have in America, was in the pillory and they threw all sorts of dead dogs, cats, bricks. You could die in the pillar. There was also other types, I mean, uh, like suspicious pamphleters or uh, printers who would print, like Thomas Paine or something like that, would have the books burnt in front of them and then they'd be put in the pillar. And there's evidence of the crowd having the collection and clapping them like that. And the authorities didn't like that. And that was one of the main reasons they stopped public animals. was because at times it, it could get a bit dodgy. You know what I mean? It was hard for them to Okay. Thank you very much indeed for listening to this. Um, right, do you want a break or do you want me to start? Democratic. Anyone want a break? <laughs> Steve wants a break. I'll just hammer on with the next one. So if you want to stick it up. Five minutes, I can make some more coffee. Okay, yeah. Right. Five just have five minutes then, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> But this, I've got to explain this, this talk I'm doing today, um, which uh, should be quite interesting to do in the US environment, and you'll see if it works or not. But basically, this talk I'm doing today is, is Steve's talk's obviously been looking at the hidden history of the 18th century, looking at hidden histories. This talk is very much centered around hidden history, but also about how radical narratives have been written about certain very important events in British history, but also about other events that, that are not so well known. So we're kind of looking at a kind of distortion or a kind of bending of history into a certain direction, uh, particularly in the Labour movement in, in Britain. 
or labour histories, trade union histories, um, and that involves a kind of distortion of history to a certain extent for certain political reasons, I'd argue, but also an, a, a tendency to ignore very important events. Um, so that's what it talks about. Um, now the difficult bit is I've got to try and talk about four events in particular, which some of you may or may not know about. Some of them are very iconic in British history, and others are pretty well unknown. So just to start, these two pictures, um, this picture here is representing a tall by the martyr, and I'll talk about them in a minute, but it's a person in chains, right? The period I'm talking about is between 1819 and 1834, okay? So, chains. This painting you might recognise, um, which is called Liberty Leading the People, comes from the French Revolution of 1830, okay, where the Bourbon dynasty was overthrown. Okay, now, so this is in the same period, very much in the same period as this. These representations, I would argue, are quite different. We'll come on to that in a minute. So if you want to put up the next slide. So just to show you what we're going to talk about, I'll do a little introduction. I'm going to talk about these four events, and I'll come on to them in a minute. Peterloo, the Bristol Riot of 1831, Captain Swing, and the Tall Bottom Markets. I've got a few thoughts and a few conclusions. Okay, I'll do what I usually do, and I did this at trade union events this year, was a straw poll, which is basically you have to participate here by putting your hand up. Okay? So don't be embarrassed if you know something, and if you don't know about it, keep your hand down. So first of all, I'm going to ask some questions, right? And I, I won't explain them. But the first one is, does anybody know, has anybody heard about or know anything about Peter Lou? If you have, put your hand up. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, mostly Brits, 10, 11, 12, 12, and a few historians. So we've got 12 people. That's probably about, what, a third of you, is it? Something like that. About a third of you know what Peter Lou is. Does anybody know um, what, what or who what is Captain Swing? If you know about Captain Swing, put your hand up. Okay, one, two, three, four. About, about the same, maybe a little bit less. But mostly okay. told by you. But mostly because I go on about it. Because <laughs> <laughs> right. you talked about it last night. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't know before that then? No, no. Right, it's lucky you. Uh, right, and. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the third question is, does anybody know who the Toll Puddle Martyrs are? Toll Puddle? Toll Puddle? Right, mostly Brits, same people again. Right, so basically I'm, I'm on a loser here, aren't I? <laughs> hey, we're, we're not Brits. Sorry, I dis yeah, but you're historians, I think. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, and I'm not even going to say Bristol 831, because I'm going to guess that the same people probably know about the riots in Bristol in 831. Certainly the Bristolians do. Yeah, okay, you've heard about this before. Okay, these are four events I'm going to look at. Um, right, I'll try and explain now what, if, if I, took you to, I took you to the TUC conference, Southwest TUC conference in, in March of this year, and I sat in a room with about a similar number of people, maybe a few more, maybe 50 or 60, and I asked the same questions. And the two questions I asked were, does anybody know what, who the toll puddle martyrs are? And the whole room put its hand up. Everybody in the trade union movement in Britain knows about the toll puddle martyrs. It's an iconic moment in their history. It's, it's a point where um, a group of rural labourers, and I'll come up, I'll do them, were, were arrested because they, they joined a friendly society, an early form of trade union or an organisation that probably led to trade unions. Okay? They were arrested, they were put under a charge which comes from a mutiny act in 1797 for signing an oath. So basically, basically they, were, they were arrested for trying to combine together form some kind of organisation that might fight for their rights and wages as workers. Okay, and it's iconic. Everybody in the trade union in Britain knows about it. And most people in Britain have heard of Toll Puddle. Toll Puddle is the village where they came from. And the Toll Puddle Martins are these rural labourers who were eventually trans tried and transported uh, uh, to Australia for their crime of forming a combination, combining together. So everybody knows about it. It's well known in Britain. It's very well known in the workers' movement the left trade unions. So it's an iconic bit of history. In the same meeting I asked those 50 or 60 trade unions who knows about Captain Swing? And I'd say about a third of the a third or less of the audience put their hands up. Okay, so maybe a group of people, oh yeah, a few historians put their hands up, a few students who were there doing some of our group just like now. So I'm just trying to get an idea in your head first of all these two events. So an iconic bit of trade union history to 
to do with these people who were sent off to Australia and transported to join a trade union. And this other event, Captain Swing, which I'll come on to in a moment, a huge series of rural riots that occurred three years before that. Probably one of the biggest outbreaks of, um, or, uh, or an up the biggest uprising in the 19th century by, by rural labourers. Okay? There's probably a bit more to it than that as well. So in my head, where this talk comes from is why is it that I've got people who are you know, educated trade unionists and know what they're talking about, they were, they were mostly organisers, but they didn't know anything about this huge event that happened, but they knew about this other event, which was iconic in their own history. And that's where the talk comes from. So I think about why was it that they knew about four people, five people sent off to Australia, but they didn't know about a massive series of, of what I would call class struggle that occurred in the same period. They had no idea about it at all. And that's what brought me to this tour. And then also, a few years ago when we did the first Radical History events, I, I started to look at the riots in Bristol of 1831, another event, okay, and how that was understood and, 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 and represented by historians. And then I also recently read this book, which is called Live, Working or Die Fighting. I would highly recommend it. It's written by an economics correspondent for the BBC who was on television a lot. But it's, it's a really good book, and he's a good working class activist, or was. <laughs> but anyway, this book talks about Peter Lou, another incident that I'll come on to. Right? Now, Peter Lou, Peter Lou um, is also iconic in the left. Peter Lou, you know, I'll explain in detail about it in a minute, is an event where a large crowd of people who are you know, working class people who'd organised to try and um, for, you know, to protest and, and campaign for enfranchisement to get the vote were cut down in, in Manchester. And it's well known, the Peterloo Massacre. It was, it was actually in St. Peter's Fields. I'll come on to why it's called Peterloo in a minute. It's a kind of ironic joke by the working class. So Peterloo, well known. Another similar iconic incident to Toll Hall. At the same time, the Bristol riots of 1831 do not fit into that category at all. They are pretty much ignored or denigrated. So that's where the talk comes from. It's trying to think about why, why, why in trade union labour history certain events are emphasised and certain events are ignored or distorted. So the two things I'm looking at, hidden histories, right? I, I was trying to think of some, some hidden history of the, of the US when I was uh, putting this together. And um, so what do I mean by hidden history? Well, I mean, I've, I've got some examples from, from Britain, which are probably useless here. But um, what I would say is, is last night we were at um, the Brett Forum and we were talking about um, hidden history. And you know, I was saying, well, OK, in the Brett Forum, I think it's very close to Houston's Tavern where the, in the Many-Headed Hydra, a very important book for our group, um, the authors Peter and Marcus talk about uh, the 1741 rebellion, or planned insurrection, which occurred very close to, I think, where the Brett Forum is. Is that right? Houston's Town? Close? Very. Okay. Now, I won't go into the details of that, but that, that's a kind of hidden history, and I, I encourage the audience last night to go out and you know, maybe do some history events around, around, something, around the 1741 insurrection, which was a potentially an, uh, an attempt to overthrow the British Empire and the Americas. Um, another example, perhaps, that I've come across recently of hidden US history is to do with Rosa Parks, which obviously is an iconic figure in American civil rights history, but I kind of learned recently, and you might want to correct me, but Rosa Parks wasn't just somebody who got on a bus one day, right? She was actually an activist, right? And so the first thing you think is, oh, you know, maybe it wasn't what I thought it was, because it's often presented as being this moment where Somebody just got on the bus and got fed up with segregation and sat in the wrong place and everything went off. And was, you know. But actually, Rosa Parks is an activist. But then I read a book by Robin Kelly called, um, not Race Rebels, I can't remember what it's called now. Robin Kelly, an, an academic who does a lot of interesting work around black history. And he'd written a really good chapter where he looked at the bus records for, for the bus company in Birmingham, Alabama, prior to Rosa Parks' intervention. Uh, for 30 years, there had been a kind of struggle going on in the buses every, every week. You know, there was people refusing to sit in the right places. There were people being chucked off buses because they wouldn't sit in the, you know, the black area. They, had to, they wanted to sit in the white area. People were shot. People were pistol whipped by bus drivers who were armed. You know, there was a whole history behind what happened to Rosa Parks. And what happened is the activists had picked up on this history and realised, right, we can go and do something around this. So suddenly it opens up another vista. That's a hidden history to me. That there was this struggle for a long time before Rosa Parks. That it was self-organised. It was, in fact, not even self-organised. It was just a reaction of working-class blacks, particularly to that kind of segregation. So that's uh, these are my examples of hidden history. Distorted history is, I, I would say, probably um, one of the most important books I read was a book about U.S. history. It was called Dynamite. 
by Lewis Adamick, and it, it talks about you know the violent class struggle of, U, of U.S. history from kind of the Molly Maguire's right the way through to gangsterism in the 90s, 20, late 20s, and early 30s. And that book, I would say, is a good example of trying of, of me realizing that U.S. history was has been very much distorted from what I've seen. I didn't realize that U.S. history was littered with such violence, you know, and the accumulation of land, also the you know, the, the, you know, the, the way you struggles of the late 19th century and, and the IWW and all this. I learned a lot when I was younger, 25 years ago, and I read that book. So that's, to me, an example of distorted history. We, I think, in Britain have a very distorted history about the US. So these are two things I'm looking at, <coughs> hidden histories and distorted histories. I'm not going to talk about sources. You'll have to talk to me afterwards about that. But. So you've got to go on, Rich. OK, Peter Lewis. It's a painting kind of what happened in Manchester in 1819. Okay? As you can see, it wasn't very nice. It's a big demonstration being cut down by, um, by soldiers and militia and cavalry. Um, and to put it in context, basically what was going on in Manchester, Manchester grew as a city very, very rapidly towards the end of the 18th century and into the early part of the 19th century. I think somebody was saying it was kind of quite a small town and then had 200,000 people. Now in this city, in 1819, a bit of, this is after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, there's radical agitation going on. The working class are made up of weavers, all sorts of other kind of wage workers and industries that are built up around Manchester and the environs of this city. And they, they were actually involved actively in a campaign uh, to fight for the vote, to get enfranchisement. There were other demands as well, obviously, formation of trade unions, all this sort of thing. So in 1819, and what I'm going to say now is kind of the narrative that most people in Britain would know about, most of the left would know about, I would argue. The narrative goes like this. Large numbers of very organised groups of working class people around the city of Manchester planned a demonstration in 1819 where the radical orator, Henry Hunt, who's probably up here somewhere, uh, would come and speak. And Henry Hunt was, you know, sort of veteran, radical campaigner for enfranchisement and other other demands. Right? And so he was coming to speak in Manchester. All around the city, um, groups of like of workers organise themselves uh, to plan a big march to hear Henry Hunt speak and kind of demonstrate that they were very uh, um, organised and, and reasonable <coughs> set of demands that they wanted. Okay? It was a peaceful demonstration. It was planned to be peaceful. No one was allowed to come along with any... You weren't even, normally in those days, to have a walking stick. You weren't even allowed to bring a walking stick. Okay? Only old people could have walking sticks. It was well organised. No weapons, no threat of anything. People marched in battalions, you know, together, wearing laurel leaves and flags, and everybody was decked out, and children, lots and lots of women on this demonstration. And this march comes into the centre of Manchester in 1819, and they gather around this in St Peter's Fields, this area of uh, Manchester, and they line up and, they, and the speeches start. Okay, what happens is, is that the local uh, kind of business class, I think that Steve mentioned earlier on, had formed a militia, had a militia, which is mainly made up of local businessmen, landowners, <coughs> kind of petty bourgeois, owners of big pubs and things like that. They got them together and they, they kind of decided that they were going to kind of stop this demonstration and arrest the radicals who were speaking. The militia turned up, they're on horses, they're armed, they've got sabres or whatever. Alongside them they've got a unit of the British Army um, cavalry as well. Okay? So in go the militia, into the crowd, they trot towards the front. There's a lot of jostling and trouble because the crowd's so big, it's something like 60,000 people, which you can imagine 1819 is a very, very big crowd. 60,000, probably a quarter of the population, maybe more. Um, they enter, the, they go to arrest the radical agitator Henry Hunt, and trouble breaks out. They do arrest Banworth and some of these other agitators, but there's trouble, and, and eventually fighting breaks out. Some of the crowd try and stop them doing it, but fairly peacefully, and panic breaks out in the crowd. And at that point, the militia start hacking and slaying the crowd. Um, and the British Army unit or cavalry go in to rescue the militia. And in the ensuing chaos, something like 400 people are injured, of which about 170 of them are cut, <coughs> cut with sabres. Um, the crowd scattered, lots of people are trampled. The first victim is a child who's you know, tossed out of the arms of a woman who's cut down by cut down by this, uh, this militia. And uh, eventually I think there was, uh, I can't remember exactly how many deaths, it wasn't many deaths, maybe 11, and then the rest of the injuries were pretty severe, people obviously died afterwards and things like that. 
the crowd's broken up, and it is iconic in British history at the moment where the ruling classes, in a kind of evil way, cut down this crowd for no particular reason. They had reasonable demands, they were peaceful, they were organised. This wasn't a mob from Kingswood. This was like proper working class people, you know, a progressive force that was cruelly cut down at that point. Um, what happens after this is there are trials, um, the radicals are put on trial for sedition or whatever, and, and, and this moment that goes down in British history is, is, is kind of a turning point, I think. Um, that's the kind of narrative that most people have written about, um, about Peterloo. Um, all I'm going to do now is, before we go any further, I'm just going to read something which is very interesting. And this is uh, this is a section in this book talking about Peterloo. Um, this is a worker from a, a suburb of Manchester. I think it's a weaver speaking here, and he's talking about what went on before Peterloo happened, before this this march was organised, and what his life was like as a worker. But one of the things he says in his in his statement is this: This is going on in the trials a lot of this stuff after the trials of these radicals, right? This is, what, this is what one worker said. He said, when dusk came and we could no longer see to work, we jumped from our spinning looms and rushed to the sweet cool air of the fields or the wasteland or, or the green lane sides. We mustered, we fell into rank, we faced, marched, halted, faced about. Or in the grey of a fine Sunday morn, we would saunter through the mists, fragrant with the night odour of flowers. A police informer, who was at, this, at the trial of these radicals as well, also said this. He gave information about similar events. So what we've got here is workers leaving their, their looms, going up onto the moors near Manchester and drilling. Okay? Mustering and drilling. And this is what a police informer said. He said, he's watching this. These hundreds, if not thousands, of working class people marching around. After they had done exercising, they formed a circle around their commander who told them that the intended meeting was cut off on account of their paper being illegal, but that would give them more time to drill. He then said they must have a colour and they must subscribe. Okay, so there's these figures, hundreds of workers around them, they're marching around. Thousands of people were involved in this drilling activity. Okay usually led by old soldiers of the line. So this is demobbed British soldiers who fought in the Napoleonic Wars, organising these, these sections of the working class. Right? A consistent detail in police reports was a simulation of firing musket volleys by clapping hands. Okay? A witness statement taken by magistrates on the 10th of August described 3,000 men drilling near Middleton, which is a suburb of Manchester. And this is what an informant said. The right wing advanced first, and the words of command, fire, front rank kneeling, and when the word of command and fire was given, they clapped their hands. The leader then advanced the left wing in the same order as the right and ordered them to fire. They clapped their hands. This was repeated several times. Okay, so this is very strange. This is happening before Peterloo. We've got like 3,000, you imagine, right? I don't know what we distance around here, but we could probably multiply that by... 50 or something. But imagine if there was like 20,000 people up in Harlem marching around, drilling on, you know, on the streets or on the, on, on the parks of Harlem right, tonight. Imagine that. Imagine there was 20,000 people doing that. Right? I mean, there'd be a national emergency. Okay? This, is, this, is, this is not stuff <laughs> that's normal. This is not people sitting around in smoky reading clubs, you know, saying, oh, you know, I think we ought to have a demonstration next week. This is major, major stuff. It's a very, very strange thing to read. And suddenly the narrative is changing here. The narrative that's been put forward about this event is not, you know, is, is for a particular reason. And I would set stress that these are the following elements of the, ne of the normal narrative of Peterloo. Okay, the normal narrative of Peterloo is basically stresses reasonable demands, that the demonstration was organised, that it was non-violent, that, you know, in fact, these people were victims of the Hussars, and that, uh, you know, it really is a question of good and evil. The authorities are evil, they cut them down, these people are good, okay? But this kind of, this information here is some, saying something quite different. It's saying, that actually, these people were planning an insurrection, or potentially planning an insurrection. That's why they were drilling in their thousands, 
That's why they marched into this square in their thousands in an organized manner. Okay? And that's the sudden switch away from, you know, from, from the way I would see it from when I was growing up and when I read about it. Okay, I'm just going to flick on to the next slide. That's all right, Rich. Okay, so I've gone, I've gone through this. I'm just going to go on to the next one. Right, a couple of times in this talk, I'm going to talk about how things are remembered. So there's a couple of plaques here, and this is the first plaque that was put up to, to remember Peterloo. And I'll, I'll explain how what Peterloo was. Peterloo was in St. Peter's Fields. This is an ironic name, because the Battle of Waterloo happened in 1815. Okay, so the ironic word for this massacre was to call it Peterloo. It's ironic, it's like saying, well, the British troops cut down the French at the um, Battle of Waterloo, and then they came to Manchester and cut down their own working class. Okay, that's why it's called Peterloo. Um, and this, this plaque here says, and this is on the site, originally on the site uh, of, um, of where the massacre occurs, it said, this is the site of St. Peter's Field, where on the 16th of August 1819, Henry Hunt, radical orator, addressed an assembly of about 60,000 people. Their subsequent dispersal by the military is remembered as Peterloo. Okay? Well, you can have a little think about a subsequent dispersal. This is a plaque that went out after that because people didn't like this one. You know, some lefties thought, well, that's a bit rubbish, really, isn't it? Because the subsequent dispersal is not 400 people cut down by sabers. Because I've got this one here, right? So Peter's Field, the Peterloo Massacre, getting somewhere now. On the 16th of August 1890, the people of Radio 60,000 pro democracy reformers, okay? I would point to this word pro democracy reformers. Right? <laughs> Men, women and children was attacked by armed cavalry, resulting in 15 deaths and 600 injuries. 600 injuries, they say. <laughs> okay, so there's a bit of a change going here. This was, I'll give you the dates of the two plaques. Um, this was earlier than 2007. This happened in 2007. But notice these words, pro-democracy reformers, men, women and children victims. victims. Pro-democracy. Okay. Now, the question is, is that what plaque should we actually put up? Because I might put a plaque on the end there which might say something like this. St. Peter's Field, the, P the Peterloo Massacre, right? On the 16th of August, 1819, a rally of 60,000 potential insurrectionists <laughs> who had been drilling for several months prior to that in the event of the need to overthrow the government and institute enfranchisement by force, uh, was attacked by armed cavalry. Uh, resistance carried on the rest of the day after the massacre. There were significant riots after that period. And in the following weeks, sections of the working class met and argued incessantly about the need to start the insurrection now because they'd hit us first. And that's evidence for that. Many of these meetings that happened after Peterloo and after the rioting, because that's not talked about at all here, resistance that actually went on, many of the meetings that went on after that were talking about, you know, basically people felt they'd done all this drilling for a long time and now was the time to strike because they'd struck first. And very, very interestingly, if you look into the history of this, the, I think it's the mayor, the person who actually launched the, the, the attack on this demonstration, clearly says that they, well, they were very frightened about all this drilling. It reminds me very much of what was going on in 1994 in Chappers, where people knew something was going on, they weren't quite sure what it was. But they certainly got in first and trapped, they smashed them first. It was a ruling class attack on what they regarded as a major threat to their position of power at that point. Yeah, that's a very different narrative to what these other things are saying. Right, move on. That's all right. <laughs> Ray, Bristol. Okay. I'm now going to counterpose Peterloo and the narrative of Peterloo, the various narratives of Peterloo, the looking at the Bristol riot of 1831. Uh, so I'm not going into much detail, but uh, again, you've got a lot of, I think, dragoons in this case, cutting people down. Um, this is a painting showing the centre of Bristol after it's been uh, pretty much um, raised by the crowd that, that, that formed in 1831. Now, why, why I brought Bristol Wright up? Bristol Wright is basically characterised by the following things, right? It happens because the Reform Act to enfranchise people is defeated in 1831, okay? It's, they put forward an act to try and enfranchise 20% of the population. At the stage, it was only 5%. Um, 
mainly the middle class men, traders, that kind of class of people, property owners. Uh, that act is defeated in Parliament. People, uh, the Speaker of the House, the House of Parliament, the House of Lords, comes to Bristol to celebrate the fact that there is no reform. He meets the bishop, he meets the leaders of the corporation around Bristol, they're having a big, they're going to have a big banquet to celebrate no democracy. Right? Unfortunately for them, a crowd, people turn up, some of whom are radicals, some of whom are political reformers, some of whom it is unclear why they are exactly there, but they turn up. And a riot breaks out, and the speaker is chased over the roofs. They, this square, Queen Square, is kind of the centre of kind of uh, local class power in the city. It's like a George's was beautiful, um, and it is completely raised by the crowd. Uh, and there are three days of rioting. And I'll, I'll come on to the uh, the targets of that rioting in a minute. But anyway, this this riot is is really characterised by the following things. Most people don't know about it. It was very important at the time. Uh, it's probably the biggest riot that happened in Britain in that period. And it's generally characterised as a kind of either a completely disorganised, drunken orgy of violence, burning and debauchery, uh, ending up in a massacre to save everybody in this horrible crowd. It's not. Or alternatively, it is sometimes by, understood by certain sections of the left as a reform act of riot. I think people turned up to very angry. This Bristol mob of working class people turned up very angry because um, they not got reform and they had a riot and you know it failed because it was disorganised. So they're the basic sort of narratives. The first narrative of disorganisation, chaos, burning and fire is the usual one. Um, I'm just going to um, flick onto the next picture, the next bit, and the next bit. Okay, it's a painting of, of done by an artist called Muller, I think, who was a famous watercolour artist, who bravely <laughs> went out that night and kind of sketched what was going on and looking at the crowd and, you know, it's a lot of it very interesting images. Painted a beautiful painting of looking over from South Bristol, a mainly working class area, over the rest of the city. This was shown to us in, uh, in the Bristol Museum where we were doing some research in 1831. We were looking at and the curator of the museum, the art curator, said, I was in the most I mean, God, it was chaos. She said, it's like, look at it, I mean, the rich, she said, most of the wealthy people went off the bath, you know, to try and hide because they were so frightened. The whole city was going to burn, you know. It was chaos, there were drunken people around setting fire to me. The whole city was burning, it was burning, it was terrible. And we stood there and said, hang on a minute, I said, this looks like Baghdad to me, right, in the invasion of Baghdad, right? And the reason is, I said, well, what's that, what's that fire there then? And she said, oh, that's, that's the bishop's palace burning. She said, they almost burned the cathedral down, which you can see here, but they managed to stop them by barring the gates. I said, oh, yeah. So I said, uh, what's that there? And she said, oh, that's Queen Square burning. It's the centre of wealthy power, the mansion house, and all that kind of financial institutions. I said, what's that? And she said, that's the big jail, the new jail. It's a huge jail built for prisoners, right? I said, what's that? And she said, it's a toll house burning as well. I said, these are precision strikes, right? This is precision strikes going on here, no question in my mind. A crowd traversed the city, destroying symbols that they hated, okay? And what they destroyed was prisons. They did three or four prisons, released all the prisoners. They did, this, they did the financial institutions, they did the clergy, burned the bishop's palace down, and they destroyed, and they also destroyed all of the wealthy area in the centre of Bristol quite systematically, looted it, had a big party as well. So this is not chaos. This is definitely not chaos in my mind. Chaos, I said, well, what happened in South Bristol where they all lived? And she said, oh, nothing happened there. Okay, nothing <laughs> at all. See this bridge, you know, you don't accept it. Nothing, well, it's fine. That's really strange, isn't it? Why didn't they burn down South Bristol as well? She said, oh, well, you know, I don't know. She said, I suppose it's about your definition of chaos. <laughs> so, this is interesting to me. Now, this does not feature, this right does not feature in any real sense until very recently as a part of radical history. And I, I think, you know, I, I could go on to talk about things like agendas, mobs, crowds, very much can, uh, on the basis of what Peter wrote about the Gordon riots, but... We'll, we'll just leave it there and go on to the next thing. Right, the Tolpuddle Bars. This is a museum for the Tolpuddle Bars. So the trade union movement, 
throw up the museum to celebrate the, these heroes of the trade union movement. And um, I was unfortunate enough, <laughs> fortunate enough to do part of this talk in front of the museum, a trade union festival which happens every year in Colpo. And I was a little bit embarrassed actually because I was going to be a bit critical of it. So I stood right in front of me doing this talk. So if you put the next slide up. Okay, what under the toll, what was the toll pod of Mars about? I've kind of explained briefly what it was around, but as, as you've seen already, um, it's kind of, uh, I suppose I could read this bit of narrative. And this is, this is basically the narrative of, of toll pod, okay, that most people in the trade union will know. Some impoverished workers, and I'll stress some words here, some impoverished workers joined the perfectly respectable Methodist led organisation which was dedicated to modern forms of industrial struggle, including the non-violent improvement of wages and conditions. As a result, the local landowners in Tolpuddle, in collaboration with an anti-union government, used a law based on mutiny and implying treason to prosecute a group of innocent men to transport them to Australia and in so doing martyr them. Okay? A massive peaceful demonstration by the urban working class eventually led to their pardon. A series of demonstrations, 100,000 people in London, where those people marched to support them, stop them being tried and sent to Australia. They failed to be with, they were off. Essentially. And eventually these people were pardoned and they returned to England to live happily ever after. Okay? <laughs> That's the story that most people know. Okay, and to give you an idea about, if you click on to the next, next slide, this is a kind of um, a slide that shows the top of martyrs here, and um, I think this is the king turning his arse on them and saying, I'm not interested in you pleading, but notice, you know, chain. Okay, that's the image. Okay. Um, Okay, so that's the toll puddle. Most people know about that trade union movement. It's um, very well known, there's a lot of history done about it. It's a festival every year, thousands of trade unions go down there to celebrate the toll puddle miles. Next slide, if that's all right, Rich. Okay, Captain Swing. Well, I didn't know a lot about Captain Swing until quite recently. But there's a really great book by Eric Popsborn and George Rudeck, if you want to read about it, called Captain Swing, and it's definitely worth having a look at. A very important moment in history where Marx, British Marxist historians started to look into, into some of this kind of hidden history of rural revolt. And Captain Swing writes of 1830 31 are part of this. Now, this picture kind of demonstrates what was going on in the Swing Riots. I'll kind of quickly go through it. Okay, over here is a rioting mob here, yeah? and they've, they've got banners that say Swing Forever. Uh, no mach no f machines, I think it says. And they're kind of wrecking threshing machines here. Right? They're burning a building. Um, down here, there's a peasant, <laughs> in fact not a peasant, a rural, a rural labourer, a rural proletarian in fact, um, carrying a noose and holding it up, and there's people here in the crowd, frightened. There's this haystack, very central haystacks, <coughs> um, and on top of here some landowners, and um, this one's saying, well I don't think Mr. Swing can come here, and he's going, fire, 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 and falling off the haystack. Okay, and over, all the and over here, there's some people involved in politics. See it? And uh, this guy is saying, I, re I recommend to this meeting the formation of a yeomanry regiment, which I am willing to take command of. And then if the base peasantry won't starve quietly, we can cut them down like chaff. And then this person is saying, uh, I think that would only make things worse. What we want is reform in Parliament with lower rents, taxes and tithes, you that think of me, hold up your hands. And everyone's going, oh, oh. So this is kind of the sweep of what's going on in the Captain Swing Riots of 1831. And what they were was a huge wave of rural revolt, basically brought on, it's arguably, by the introduction of threshing machines, which meant that large numbers of rural labourers, well, especially in the winter, couldn't get enough wages or work to, to survive. Plus, it also forced the wages down, bringing the machines in. Plus, there have been two terrible winters, I think, in 1828 and 29 which meant there was less work and there was obviously less food around. And the result was, in 1830, in the summer of 1830, a movement began in, in Kent, in Essex. I'm oh, sorry, in Kent, which is just kind of southeast of London, and swept across the country in three or four months. It was a huge movement of people 
I'll just give you some ideas about that if you go to the next slide. And the next one. Okay, this, this is some recent work that's been done on Captain Swing Rides. Every time they look at these events, George, uh, Eric Hosborn and George Rude looked at this in the late 60s, and they came up with that there was kind of 1,500 incidents of things like uh, machine breaking, uh, various types of riot, extortion, um, robbery, uh, robbery in this case is basically extortion, uh, incendiarism, uh, assaults on poor law officials. They reckon there's about 1,500 incidents. Since then, more work has been done, and we're now up to something like 3,500 incidents occurring across the whole of Britain. Okay, and you can see, I think you can read this, you, it's the kind of thing that's going on. You've got to bear in mind things like robbery 252. That's, um, that's a, a lonely term, robbery. Extortion by crowd, collective bargaining by riot is what's going on. So basically, all around the country, Groups of rural labourers in this wave of disturbances began to confront their landowners, confront the local clergy who were taking their tithes, and either demand the destruction of the machines, demand money, or um, basically show who was in control in, that, in those regions. And that was what's going on across the country, all sorts of stuff going on. This is very interesting. Rescue of protesters from custody, 102. So that's clearly people going, you know, getting people back from the, from the local authorities. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can kind of see the scale of this. So these, this is kind of swing incidents plotted out on, on, on Britain. Starts in, Essex, in Kent, sweeps across southern England in a few, like, about a month to get from one side of here to there. You get across Sussex, it took two weeks. It's hit right down Dawson, down to Bristol, all the way out through East Anglia. It's a huge movement. You can see this kind of wave of incidents occurring in these months, October, November, December 1830 into 1831. Now, this is massive. This is a huge movement. I can't, we don't even know the half of it yet because we haven't got enough all the evidence in. It's still being sought. You know, it's recent, two years ago, this work was done by people all over the country went to their local parish registered read newspapers and, and used the internet to build it up. So, if you go to the next slide, you can get an idea about it. So, I wrote an essay called um, The Flea and the Elephant, Told by Lynn Swing. Okay, because to me, Tolpole is a completely most iconic um, part of history. It's, it's, it's kind of a flea compared to this incident, Swing. Now, Tolpole happens in 1834, Swing happens in 1830-31, so they're quite close together as, as a, two events. But, um, you know, it amazed me at the time that, you know, that I could go into a meeting with a bunch of trade unionists, and this, a lot of them are rural organisers for, you know, in, in, in these counties and that they didn't know anything about Captain Swing and they knew about this one incident. So I have to ask yourself, why is that? Why do, we, why do, why do trade unionists or members of the labor, labor movement or even lefties know about Tolpo, but they know nothing about Swing, they know nothing about this huge wave of class struggle? And I kind of came to a conclusion or <laughs> some thoughts about this, and about which I call ticking the boxes, which applies to all of the things I've talked about. Um, And last, yeah, okay, to start with the first box, innocence and guilt, okay? It's one of the things I talk about when I look at these historical events. Innocence and guilt, okay? The top of the martyrs are innocent. This lot, these swing rioters and their thousands, if they're tens of thousands, are definitely guilty, okay? They're really difficult to deal with historically if you're trying to create propaganda for the labor movement, okay? It doesn't work. You can't have people actually burn things down and run around in mobs extorting your stuff off the welfare or breaking machines. It, it, it doesn't work. Okay, they're guilty. Okay, and to give you an idea about the, why I hate the word martyrs when it's applied to toll pole, these martyrs are transported you know, to Australia. Well, to give you an idea about what happened in Swin, right, the human cost is unbelievable. Okay, there were 2,000 trials during the Swin riots, 2,000 trials. 252 people were sentenced to death, okay, of which 19 were eventually executed. 644 were imprisoned. <coughs> 500, 500 people were transported to Australia for terms of 7 to 14 years, by well, little hope of ever returning. This was the largest group of prisoners ever transported from England for a common crime. Now that's got to be on the historical map, isn't it? The largest group of people ever to be transported for one crime, or a group of crimes, that were associated with one incident. 
Right, and, and Hoswald and Rudane kind of get this when they're writing their book about Captain Swing. They say, in the south of England, there were whole communities that for a generation were stricken by the blow. From no other protest movement of, the, of its kind, neither from neither the Luddites, nor the Chartists, nor trade unions, was such a bitter price exacted. So these, these, these swing writers, they're the martyrs. They're clearly the martyrs. Calling the toll puddle by six people, wherever they were, so now, martyrs is kind of a joke when you've got this sitting behind them. Okay, so that, that, this is one of the things I look at. Innocence and guilt. Okay. Secondly, um, it's only very recently that these incidents, of the, the swing has started to be recognised. If you go on to the next slide. Okay, this is two pictures I think are really funny. Well, certainly this one over here. Okay, this is a plaque which was put up in February this year in, in Salisbury where a lot of the trials for swing rioters were done. Okay, and um, it's supported by the trade unions and we went down. It's probably the first plaque, major plaque, to be put up to remember these <coughs> hundreds of people who were tried, some of them executed or transported for these rural, these rural um, rebellions. Okay, so we went down there and, you know, it's in the guild hall now. It, says, it actually says, in commemoration of the local men and women who, who appeared before this court as a result of the agricultural riots of 1830. This picture is even more interesting. This happened a little bit after. This is from um, somewhere in Middlesex, I think. And, um, oh, sorry, Hampshire, which is a county south of London. And what I like about this picture is they're celebrating a swing rioter who was executed, a guy called Henry Cook. And what he did was, he, well, we're not quite sure whether he did it, but a landowner came down to deal with a rioting mob of swing, you know, swing rioters that turned up. And um, a hammer was, or somebody tried to strike um, Lord Baring. Okay? Baring, does that ring the bells, anyone? Yes. Yes. Baring's, <laughs> Baring's Bank, yeah, one of the big merchant banks that probably did go out of business recently. Or <laughs> no, I'm not crying about it. So Lord Baring comes down to his swing riders. Henry Cook apparently takes a swipe at him with a hammer. He kind of falls off his horse and knocks his hat on himself. And Henry Cook's executed for it. He didn't actually really hit him or anything. And he gets executed. And this group of people, of parishioners in this church, put this plaque up to celebrate Henry Cook. Okay? To say it was wrong that he was, he was hung. And this, is, this is kind of a big change of room. A bit of understanding out of that swing. You know, they, but I, I laugh because these parishioners are sitting here like supporting a riot <coughs> Okay, I'll try and draw this together now and shut up. <laughs> okay, if you go on to the next slide. Right, these are my thoughts about all of this, these four incidents and what's going on here, why, for example, Peter Lewis remembered, Tolpud is remembered, Swing is, is kind of not, is a hidden history, and the Bristol 1831 riot is a distorted history, in my opinion. First of all, this what I talked about previously is about the violence, use of violence and non-violence. Peterloo, non-violent, Tolpuddle, non-violent, Swing, violent, 1831, violent, oh dear. You tick the boxes of Peterloo and Tolpuddle for your propaganda purposes at the time. You can't tick the boxes for 1831 and Captain Swing. Right, secondly, formal organisation spontaneous or spontaneity or spontaneous revolt. Very much stressed by the left about Peterloo is this organisation. What they don't stress is that organisation was a military organisation that was up for insurrection. Okay, but they stress the organisation, a proper movement, a political party in the making. Um, spontaneous events like 1831, the riots or, or Captain Swing just do not tick the right boxes. So ignore them. Okay, formal organisation applies to Tolpol because they were joining a trade union, a Methodist organisation. The cards of victims or insurgents, I mean, this relates to, to these times, you know. I mean, one of the, a lot of work's been done on Captain Swing over the last few years, and, you know, there's more and more evidence coming out that, that rioters, in, particularly in the counties of Sussex and, and Kent, marched around with tricolours, Caps of Liberty, Caps of Liberty? Most people in England don't know what that is, but, you know, they marched around, they, I mean, for example, in Kent, in Kent um, you just had this revolution of 1830, you know, the Liberty League of People had just happened before that. The country was in kind of uproar about, about these revolutions in Europe. I think Bel there was a revolution where Belgium had succeeded from the Netherlands that year as well. So what's going on in Britain at the time is there's a big sort of either fear or, or happiness about the fact that there's a revolutionary movement breaking out in France. For example, in Kent villages, rural labourers collect money for the victims of the revolution. I mean, what I mean is for the revolutionaries who were killed in Paris. Now, have a think about that. Okay, 1830, I mean, 
1830, there's like rural labourers collecting money in villages in Kent and giving it to French revolutionaries. Okay? So when these riots happen, you do see an awful lot of influence of radical agitation. And um, I, mean, I won't go into detail of it, but all I can say to you is, is that there's a lot more to swing than meets the eye. Okay? It's, it's often been characterised as a bunch of starving rural labourers and that's it. But it was a lot more to it than meets the eye. It probably brought down the government. On November the 9th, 1830, Wellington's reactionary government collapsed and the Whigs took power. It's probably had a part to play um, in getting us democracy and reform, the first stages of democracy the year after the Reform Act. Um, so again, you know, the, these images of Peterloo, maybe they, they were insurgents. In swing, there was major politicisation, I would argue, and there were certainly attempts to politicise it, far beyond the demands of the rural labourers. And as we know, revolutions are not clean and tidy things. They're not organised by groups of people in reading rooms who suddenly decide to form a proletarian army and take over. You know, revolutions are un uncomfortable and um, changing moments. And you know, as we know from the French Revolution, you know, if the French revolutions have failed, they may have been dismissed as a bunch of rioters like in 1831. They, they succeeded. So there's a lot more to these events than meets the eye. But those things are a little bit embarrassing for social democratic history, so they kind of obscure it. The last thing I want to talk about is this thing called the two-sided what I call the two-sided coin of modernity. That's a bit, a bit of a phrase, but uh, what I mean by that is, is that I would argue that there's kind of two ways of, or two strands of thought about particularly 19th century history which are which are worth looking at. The first one well, worth understanding. The first one is kind of proto-capitalist, pro-capitalist sort of Whiggist history in Britain, which kind of is what we call modernism. Which says that you know the history proceeds through a whole series of you know kind of um, changes, but they're all kind of progressive, and eventually you get to you know modern you know, representative democracy and capitalism, and that's great, and that's one side of it. And those histories particularly stress that you know things like the peasant are backward, um, you know, rural revolts are backward, the introduction of machinery is progressive, and the reaction to it, like machine breaking, is backward. You know, and they, you know, they kind of definitely stress that. In fact, they pretty much ignore rural revolts altogether. But where they do have to deal with them, they basically say they're reactionary. So you get Luddite, you know, the word Luddite gets turned on its head. Um, the other side of this coin is classical Marxist history, which I'd almost also suffers from similar problems. Because classical Marxist history, and I use the word classical in the sense that um, I won't go into the detail of this, but what I mean by that is the straightforward Marxist histories of perhaps of the early 20th century. And they, what they say is, is that, you know, okay, we've got to go through this process from feudalism, socialism, eventually we get to communism, sorry, feudalism, <laughs> so, uh, feudalism, capitalism, and then socialism and communism. So, you know, go through this thing. And basically, if, if anything you're doing, if you're a peasant, you've got, you, you can't really, you know, you can't really over, you can overthrow feudalism, you can't really do much else than that. We proletarianised before we can overthrow capitalism. You know, so there's all kind of like hurdles you've got to jump over. You know? So if you're a peasant, you can't you can jump over the feudal hurdle. We can't jump over the capitalist hurdle. When we proletarianise, we can jump over the capitalist hurdle. And, and that kind of is also a modernist history. And, and the problem with it is, is that it has difficulty then dealing with class struggle, which doesn't quite fit the model. Um, so sometimes it ignores it, and sometimes it kind of denigrates it. Uh, but to give credit to the British Marxist or the classical historians, you know, or classical Marxist historians like you know, kind of early Thompson, Hobsbawm, Rude, a lot of the people who are doing all that. They did actually uncover a lot of this rural revolt. And they did un uncover it through their research because they were looking at history from below and social history. And the problem is, this is two sided coin means that a lot of history is dominated by these two ideas, either like this establishment history of like, you know, pro capitalist history or a classical Marxist history, which doesn't, you know, can't quite deal with a lot of this stuff. That's why I would argue that. From both sides of the academy, whether it's the classical Marxist history or the, or the um, sort of Whiggist history, things like Captain Swing have been ignored, and, and certain events like machine breaking as part of that are also ignored. So, for example, they often people often talk about rural labourers as peasants, but they weren't actually; they were proletarians, in fact. So they, you know, there's a lot of misunderstandings about talking about swing rioters. There's also the problem of the lumpen as well, which I think Peter talks about quite a lot with the picaresque proletariat. The idea of lumpen being, you know, the sort of section of the class that's not really integrated properly into work, you know, this the discipline of capitalist labour. So therefore, what it does is kind of, at best, <coughs> irrelevant, at worst, reactionary. 
Okay, so it's sort of a classical Marxist sort of problem. So a lot of things like 1831 riots are kind of seen as a bit lumpen, you know, not really, can't really deal with that, so we'll ignore that. And also, a lot of the tactics, the word I think Eric Hosborn uses quite a lot, a lot of the tactics of the, in these struggles, particularly in swing, also in 1831, also the Luddites, sort I of think, are pre, they call pre-industrial. And what pre-industrial means is that you do things like machine, great machines, you do collective bargaining by riot, you do that, that kind of tactics where communities like Steve been talking about earlier on, that would be called pre-industrial in Kingswood, that kind of rioting, or moral economy, that kind of thing. Uh, those kind of protests and, and so that often gets kind of denigrated and to a certain respect, respect um, history really for a lot of the trade union movement, the labour movement, the left begins with the Chartists in 1830 and 1840 anything happens before that's kind of irrelevant and not really important in fact somebody said to me in a meeting about, <laughs> about Captain Swing said well you know it's a bunch of starving labourers you know what's, what's, why are you interested in that yeah. well as far as I understand um, I'm sure that Karl Marx, who's sitting here now, probably say, well, class struggle is quite important. <laughs> you, know, you shouldn't ignore things because they don't fit the model. And you certainly shouldn't ignore things because, um, you know, you, I mean, history is history. You can't, you can't just sweep away whole bits of history and say, well, you know, I'm not making any comment about whether those tactics were the right thing to do, but they certainly something we should be aware of. And finally, there's a problem of politicisation, which is that, you know, these, often these events like Swing 1831 in Bristol are perceived as being apolitical, okay? And that was kind of, that certainly fits in with the idea that, you know, it's chaos, they burn the city down. They didn't really know what to do it. In fact, somebody argued, a local historian, uh, an academic historian in Bristol, who's actually somebody we have got to speak before, said that, well, Bristol wasn't really a radical place in the 1830s. It didn't have any reading clubs or radical clubs. So there were no like radical clubs with people sitting around knocking out leaflets. And that's why Bristol wasn't radical. Well, you know, class struggle goes a little bit further than a few smoky reading rooms, as far as I'm aware. So this problem of politicisation is very interesting because it is how things are perceived. And if you look at an event and think, well, that's apolitical, then you won't find the things you're looking for. And in fact, with Swing, we start to find more and more stuff about that it was actually very politicised, perhaps Republican. Similarly with Peter Lewin, you look a bit deeper than the kind of narrative of labour history, and you find that there's insurrection in there, there's republicanism, there's all sorts of ideas floating around the organised working class. There's stockpiling weapons. This is not something that fits into that narrative. So finally, I'm going to conclude, because I've gone on too long probably. I'm not happy. Yeah. All right. So you want to show the next slide, Rich? OK, so I hope you know, I've sort of exposed some hidden histories about some of these events. Try to count the so you can sort of see the differences between them. Uh, you have to take my word for it. If you've never heard about these events before, they're understood quite differently in Britain. Um, and I've also talked about these distorted histories. I've also brought up this question of class struggle in many forms. As I said, you know, there's a tendency within the left to believe that, like, post, you know, it starts with the formation of trade unions. In fact, somebody said to me, the working class didn't, there was no working class until you had trade unions, which is kind of, a very strange idea, but I think it certainly dominates some of that thinking. Until you've got trade unions, they're not really interested. They're not even a working class, really, because they haven't actually become a class for itself. Okay. Also, we're talking about agency as well. You know. Agency, you know, is, agency means like you know the fact that people can actually make some decisions without actually being told by outside what to do or by outside forces. And agency figures a lot in these events, like, and I won't talk about that too much. Now. Finally, I, I hopefully I've demonstrated that the fact a lot of these people weren't actually victims, which is the way they were portrayed, certainly in Peter Little and Tolpuddle. In fact, there's a good story about Tolpuddle, just to finish, right? When, when one of the Tolpuddle martyrs, one of these trade unions, early trade unions, was sent to Australia, okay, he arrived and he was put on a kind of uh, plantation somewhere, I think probably in Tasmania, and Van Diemen's land, I think. And when he arrived there, Hosborn and Rude got some really interesting information because this top of the mark arrived and they went, oh, you're one of the Dorset machine breakers. Mm. That's what they said. We've got loads of them here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure he ran into some of his mates there, people he knew, maybe from other villages or other towns. So what I'm trying to get there is the idea that, you know, perhaps these top of the martyrs weren't so much martyrs after all. In fact, three years before, they may have been in one of those swing mobs who was going around extorting the wealthy, breaking machines and burning haystacks and buildings down to try and increase their wages. So 
we have to be a little bit careful about bracketing these people as victims. They may have ended up in victims in 1834, but the real victims were from the swing riots of 1830. And Peterloo, we might not be talking about innocent civilians cut down, we might be talking about guilty insurgents cut down by a ruling class who reacted before they left it too late. And that's it. Mm -hmm. So I won't long, probably. Mm -hmm. So what do you want? Right. Uh, thanks, that was really great. Um, uh, so was there any stories about what happened in Australia, what all these, uh, in terms of uh, insurrection on the plantations, or what happened when all these rebels were transported? Well, I'll definitely suggest, I mean, I'll definitely suggest reading, read the Captain Swing book, because what's great about Hobbesbourne and Roulet's history of Captain <coughs> Swing is they don't stop with the point where these people are transported. They actually carried on doing research about all these people who were sent into, you know, into Australia. And they come up with various different conclusions. I mean, one of the conclusions was said that, 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 interestingly, that these swing rioters, these evil incendiaries, these like demons of the, of, you know, the countryside who beat and threatened people to get money, in fact, they were the most, un they were less, they weren't unruly prisoners. In fact, they were seen as very honorable men. So, you know, that kind of turns things on its head a bit, because that would suggest to me that perhaps these people weren't um, the criminals, or the way they were perceived as criminals, they weren't actually criminals, they were actually a bit more, a bit more sussed out, a bit more, um, you know, politicised than perhaps we imagined. They, they had, you know, a whole series of values based on, you know, kind of that idea that we really says, well, actually, they weren't, you know, kind of, they didn't end up in all sorts of criminal activities. I'm not, you know, I would definitely read that section to find out a bit more about what happened in Australia, but they certainly chart them, you know, chart all these groups of people, these hundreds and hundreds of people and, um, who were sent there, and, you know, they, they look on, you know, they see what happens to them, whether some of them came back. The interesting thing is the Toll Puddle Martins actually came back from Australia <laughs> after this big campaign, um, but they didn't stay in England, I don't think they could really go back to their villages, they came back in about 1837 or something, so I'm not going to correct me on that, but when they came back, they ended up in Canada, which is where a large number of rural labourers were sent after the swing riots. So there's a kind of a jump to, to the transportation and all that you know, misery. One of the most interesting things that happened after swing was that two, two or three changes were made. What the authorities realised was that they had large numbers of rural labourers running around who were like, you know, it, you know, who were effectively becoming overmanned, so they became surplus to requirements of, of local, you know, sort of industrialisation of agriculture. So, yeah, you know, rural labor's wages going down, and they were trouble, and obviously trouble in 1831. So the authorities came up with several plans. One of them was assisted repatriation. <laughs> so the authorities, well, how do we get deal with all these bloody unemployed laborers, you know, causing all this trouble? So what they did was they offered the money to go to Canada. So a large number of these laborers were actually shipped out of the counties around London and sent to Canada. In fact, that's where the toll puddle martyrs ended up. They ended up in Canada. So it was kind of early prime. The other thing they did, which is something that most people in Britain don't know, do you, do you know what, do you have allotments here? Allotments? Somebody describe what they are? What's that? Yeah, they're kind of, what's that? Urban gardens. Urban gardens, yeah, you kind of get a little bit, you can, it's an apply to get a little bit of land, so you can grow vegetables and things like that, and they have plots and allotments around Britain. That comes from, partly from the swing riots. Because they, the problem they have is it's sort of starving labourers who are dispossessed of the land, they're proletarians. You know, if the wages go down, they've got nothing, they're finished, you know. So they suddenly thought, oh my god, you know what we've got to do? We've got to give them some land back. <laughs> you know, take all the land away from them. They decided to give it back, a little bit back, so they didn't starve. So allotments in Britain, this thing that people really regard as kind of their right to, uh, to have a little bit of land you can apply to the council to get it, and just rent it a little bit actually come from the swing riots. So there were a lot of consequences from the swing riots which I haven't gone into in detail. I mean certainly threshing machines were kind of, Hobbesborn and Rude, I would argue that threshing machines were actually banned or not allowed to be used effectively because of the swing riots for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. So they actually halted capitalist sort of industrialisation of agriculture in that particular sort of, um, that particular facet of agriculture. So they were kind of successful. You know, they actually stopped me happy. You know, the Luddites perhaps weren't, but the swing riots has actually had an impact. They certainly held their own for about 10 or 20 years. They, helped, they, they protected themselves by stopping the use of threshing machines. And that's not happened many times in history, I would argue, where you know, kind of industrialisation has been stopped. 
Um, so I, I don't know if I've answered your question. Definitely read the Captain Swim and read about Australia and we'll do about what happened afterwards. Maybe a more focused question. Uh, but it's still big. It's in relation to Hobsbawm and uh, Thompson, both be historians, quite well known. Uh, and you've mentioned, both of you have mentioned at least Thompson and you more Hobsbawm a lot. And I'm just curious, because you talked about this kind of uh, bias in terms of uh, the lenses of looking at certain things and not at other things. And I just wanted your own sort of expertise through your own work, what you found to be most kind of problematic in terms of their contributions, because you've also said very good things about them, but, but it's hard to tell other than this kind of bias against a progressivist idea of history, what, what exactly for you is more problematic? Okay, well, my, my you can take. focus on it, either one of them. Okay, well, if, if I if again go back to Captain Swing, it's a very interesting book to read because I know it's a great bit of history, historical research. One of the things you get across when you're reading it is, is that <coughs> I'm going to read a go in from a classical Marxist position. Okay, they go into this analysis and um, they get all this information and they kind of want to look for certain things, they want to look for other things, but what happens is you feel they're totally, they're kind of fettered in this book. Okay. So they, they do things like go, how could this have happened? So they think, oh, we better go and look and see if there were organisations already existing in communities you know, that, that kind of could have led to. They look for friendly societies, Methodist groups. They're looking for this kind of formal organisations that, that must lie behind it. You know, it must have some impact on what it is. They kind of don't find much. You know, they're a bit like, well, you know, because what they're looking for is some kind of structure in there, you know, some kind of structure they understand, something that, that, that fits in with kind of like perhaps ideas about how working class organisations develop. <coughs> and they can't really find that. Um, then they get excited because they come across these really strange events. They, they come across things like marches, as I mentioned before, where there's clear politicisation. You know, there's kind of republican ideas. You know. People <coughs> remember, you've got to remember the swing riots. It's not that long since the Napoleonic Wars. You know. 15 years of war against France, you know, and this is Labour's marching around, you know, with French flags, with tricolours, you know. And so they kind of say things like, well, they were probably just trying to annoy the authorities, right? And, you know, you look at that and you think, well, I don't know. And then they kind of do some stuff on cobblers, like right? shoemakers. They find that, you know, do some studies on shoemakers, and they find that in all the villages, or, you know, if there were rioting swing villages, they would, you'd probably like need to have three or four times the number of shoemakers in the village. They were, you know, famously radical shoemakers, they were, you know, Republican ideas of the franchise. So they're kind of looking at all this stuff. But what's problematic is, it, you know, they, they, they can't let they can't <coughs> themselves go down there too far. You know, they kind of find this stuff and then kind of dismiss it. And then they look for some organisation, it's not there, so they kind of drop that. And they're clearly having a problem in understanding how such a wave of, of, of you know, activity could actually happen. And they don't really, I would argue, come to many conclusions, other than the fact they put all this exciting information up there that they found, and they get to the end and go, at the end of the day, it was just, a, you know, it was limited. It was completely limited. It was like, you know, it was, a, it was based around wages. It, you know, it was related to very limited demands. It wasn't possible for these rural laborers really to go any further than they could, they did. And although there was elements of politicisation, it doesn't really work. And that, that kind of a, is really the fettering of classical <coughs> Marxism. It's saying, well, you know, they're not in the right position. Now, you know, and to put it bluntly, it boils down to this, right? Okay, they weren't peasants. They recognised that. They were rural proletarians. But you know, a lot of classical Marxist theory believes that, you know, it's about positioning of groups in society in terms of their potential for revolutionary movement. And what, what classical Marxism says, well, you know, the countryside is backward. <laughs> The cities are a breath of, breath of fresh air, so it's going to happen in the cities, it can't happen in the countryside. Secondly, um, they say things like, it's got to be the industrial proletariat that does it, because they're at the centre of power in the capitalist, or the most influential point in the capitalist, you know, uh, in capitalist industries, and you know, they, it's got to be industrial proletarians that do it, it can't be these other people, so they have to put that kind of fetter on what they're doing. Another crime I would say, well, you know, it's got to be sections of the working class are in the factories because they're the only way they can for, produce these organisations that we recognise as being revolutionary, like political parties, you know, formations like that. So all these fetters are on it all the time. 
And I think that's the problem I've got with, if I was going to be really specific about what they're, what, what's going on. They've got in with these preconceptions and therefore the history doesn't quite fit in and they have to dismiss things and drop things. And I'll argue that the swing movement was necessarily revolutionary, but I would say it would be wrong to suggest that it was purely a wage dispute. That would be, uh, hopefully that answers it. Is that it? Do we cut the scene? Yeah. Uh, Okay, if, um, if you don't know already, um, I think it was, when was it, last Saturday? Yeah. Last Saturday we, uh, we carried out an interesting recreation in Bristol, which we talked about last night. We, um, Annie, and, Annie and myself were chatting in, in, a, in a radical history meeting, and we were looking for an anniversary which would kind of coincide with something, an event we wanted to do on the suffragette movement. And uh, we came across this event that happened in Bristol 100 years ago, uh, actually, when is it? It's Monday, isn't it? 15th. 15th, yeah. 15th of November 19, uh, 1909, a um, hundred years ago in Bristol, uh, Winston Churchill, who was current Home Secretary, Winston Churchill. <laughs> you wouldn't get that in England, would it? Anyway, uh, Winston Churchill was travelling to Bristol for a meeting. In fact, I think he was just getting off a train in the Central Station Temple Meads in Bristol and um, got onto the platform with his wife Clementine Churchill and um, out of the crowd ran a woman, Theresa Garnett, who was a suffragette and she famously whipped him with a riding crop and uh, shouted out, that's for, the, that's, for the, that's for the insulted women of England and uh, she was dragged off um, after she'd almost pushed him onto the rails apparently, his wife saved him. <laughs> and, uh, and history might be different. But um, anyway, he, she was dragged off shouting votes for women in, in, put in, in a prison in Bristol. Um, the reason she did that was because Winston Churchill had introduced force feeding for suffragette prisoners who were on hunger strike a lot of the time. So we recreated it. If you look at our website or you come tomorrow night at the Blue Stockings, we'll show you the video, the, the, the film event. Um, but out of that came a suffragette event last Saturday, which Annie spoke. And She's going to repeat her talk now, so I'm going to hand you over to Annie. Alright, well, obviously I'm going to be talking about suffragettes, but before I get stuck into that, I'm just going to state my sources, because it's supposed to be a historian. Um, main ones being One Hand Tied Behind Us, a book by an academic from Leeds University called Jill Liddington. Another one of her books called The Suffragette. The Ascent of Women by Melanie Phillips, The Strange Death of Liberal England by George Dangerfield, and In Letters of Gold by Rosemary Taylor. Okay, so suffragette, obviously suffrage and fran enfranchisement. We're talking the suffragette era between 1903 and 1914. And in Britain and in America, I think it's sort of a bit different in terms of who was enfranchised and who wasn't. I believe in America that women had to vote in some states at different times, but not others. Um, so to put into context, there are three main reform bills um, to enfranchise the population before 1903. One in, 19, no, one in 1832, which we talked earlier about a failed one in 1831. And in 1832, this enfranchised about 20% of the adult male population generally upper classes and like aristocracy and bourgeoisie. Another one in 1867 and then the last one in 1884. None of these enfranchised any women at all. In fact, the 1832 Reform Act was the first one to explicitly say no women at home. And after the 1884 Reform Act, like most men in Britain, a whole men from a genre of all, all of different classes had vote, but no women did. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about an, a quote that I got from a woman named Dora Montefiore, who I'll be talking about later, who was a British communist. We're talking about radical history today, as we said, about uncovering hidden histories and stuff like that, and my one is really sort of like touching what Roger did, is challenging established narratives. The 
suffragettes have seemed really quite radical, but we were, I think it was at his house, talking about it. We were questioning really how radical were they, not just in their means, their militancy, and them chaining themselves to railings and all this, but what were they actually aiming for? So the suffragettes were mainly run by a family called the Pankhurst family, you might have heard of, British family, who, these Pankhurst women are put up on a historical pedestal, and it's seen that women gaining the vote is generally down to their work. These women are sort of given all the credit for it, and I want to bring them down from this historical pedestal. Doing my exams in school, I was studying suffragettes, and going through the textbooks, I was thinking, well, what on earth are working class women doing at this point? How could you have such an amazing movement that only a small number of people managed to do? From a very elite social status, it didn't really make sense. So I did a lot of research to try and find out what working class women were doing and why they aren't attributed any credit in sort of established narratives and in history as we know it. Pankhurst and suffrage, and suffrage have become synonyms in Britain and they really shouldn't be. And the contribution of other female activists and groups have been really marginalised and they need to be rehabilitated. And we need to think really about how much the suffragette movement really contributed towards wider feminism, not just enfranchisement. <coughs> just a little bit of a brief history. There are two main types of suffrage campaigner. The original battle for suffrage for women in England started in 1865 with the suffragists. Our suffragists are peaceful campaigners. They use sort of constitutional methods, they petition, they lobby MPs. And their organisation is called the National Union for Women's Suffrage Societies. Now these women have gained small victories in regards to getting women more involved in public life. But as we said, in 1865 they started their campaign, and yet in 1903, when the suffragettes are really set up, women still don't have the vote. That's almost 40 years of campaigning. The second type of campaigner is a suffragette. Their um, organisation is called the Women's Social and Political Union. Again, this is founded in 1903 by the Pankhurst family in Manchester, and it becomes militant from 1905 onwards. <coughs> Suffragette, the word, was a phrase coined by the Daily Mail at the time. It was seen as quite, being used as quite a derogatory word, like et meaning little, to try and put down these women and what they were thinking, but they, right, took it on and they said, no, we're not going to stand for that, we're going to use it, use it as our identity. Mm -hmm. So Pankhurst family then, in the middle there is Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughter Christabel Pankhurst. Emmeline, Christabel, Sylvia and Adela were the main founders of this militant movement. They were the wife and the daughters of a sort of left-wing politician who died in 1897 called Richard Pankhurst. And the society to begin with really sort of embraces left-wing, more sort of that way leaning, that way inclined policies and convictions. Their first aim is to try and recruit more working class women and to try and put pressure on the IRP, the Independent Labour Party at the time. But as you'll see later on, they seem to move away from this. And then you start to question, well, how radical really were they? <coughs> okay, so thinking about how radical a group is, you could think about, well, how does it structure itself? Is it a democracy? Is it an autocracy? And the Women's Social and Political Union, which I'm going to be calling the WSPU because it's a bit of a mouthful, is run under a system of hierarchy. So women at sort of rank and file, they don't have much of a say in what goes on. Emmeline and Christabel and Sylvia are the central committee of the group. And they basically have a subcommittee who are their friends and family to help them make decisions. And at home sessions where they invite women to 
come and sort of sit around and they can discuss the ideas they've come up with and how they want to initiate them. And then 11 regional offices, you'd be going around the country and telling women of all these different branches what to actually be doing, what they've decided. But I think what's really important to note straight away is that this is a group that is campaigning for democracy and to be part of a democracy of a country in which they live. But straight away, they don't practice that within their own organisation, which I think is quite strange. It was one of the first reasons that I started to question how radical the suffragettes and their organisation really were. It's been quite critiqued as quite hypocritical, the fact that they weren't democratic themselves. Emily Pankhurst explicitly stated that she wanted her women to walk in step and take their instructions like an army, which I think really sums up their approach to how they're going to structure the organisation. Okay, so as I said, the initial aim was to recruit more working class women. So they start off, they really want to get all the women involved. They've got these ideas which are rooted in a more socialist background. But Christabel, who is the oldest daughter, is made the official leader of the WSP and the sort of, I don't know, the autocrat. With her decisions that she takes in between, I'd say, 1903 and 1907 particularly, all these convictions which the group was ingrained in to begin with sort of are lost and they move away from them. An example of this is the move from Manchester, where it was founded, Manchester's in the north of the country, down to London. And this sort of showed a physical representation of how the group had moved away. It moved away in the fact that originally they were very into working with the Independent Labour Party at the time. At the time of this, the, the leader was really sympathetic to the cause of votes for women. But they moved away and decided they didn't want to be part of such an organisation with such ideas. Christabel said that she didn't want the group to be involved in party politics, but there's another quite a lot of other reasons which I found out about. The group wanted to raise £20,000, and obviously, in order to do that, you're going to need to recruit women from the social elite. Socially and women from the social elite, middle class, women from like, I don't know, bourgeoisie, place, people like that, they're not going to be impressed with you working with a political party which is aimed towards helping and advancing the workers. So that's another reason for it. But another thing is, well, what Christabel says is that she thinks the Houses of Parliament should be more impressed by the demonstrations of the feminine bourgeoisie than of the feminine proletariat. <laughs> and you sort of see how they've gone from a group founded on working class ideologies and they just move away and they start saying things like that. Again, this is easier to recruit, recruit middle class women, but it starts to become more fashionable in middle class and it distances working class women further. When you have a group which is mainly people from a certain class, it distances the women from the other classes in that, say where you have your meetings or at home sessions, would be in an area that was middle class, and working class women wouldn't be expected to be in that area at the time. Another difference is working class women had to work, obviously, and the way they structured their meetings and their demonstrations and things, we're not at a time where anyone could attend and join in. They were at a time where only certain women could because the others had to work and earn a living because their income was so important to their families. This phrase was described by Sylvia Pankhurst um, as an example of Christabel's incipient Toryism. You find in lots of sources lots of friction, both politically and obviously because they're siblings between Christabel and Sylvia. And as you'll see later on, they really, they're sort of icons of separate ideas and aims and ways of doing things that to suffer <coughs> through. So this is what Sylvia said. 
summed up Christabel's views. She said, a working woman's movement is of no value. Working women are the weakest position of the sex. How could it be otherwise? Their lives are too hard, that education too needed to equip them for the contest. Surely it is a mistake to use the weakest in the struggle. We want picked women, the very strongest and the most intelligent. We have to think here now is there a group trying to get women to vote, but only some women. And they're really, instead of trying to get equality throughout all of society, they're imposing new inequalities and class differences, which originally they wouldn't have done. What they were actually aiming for, unlike what's popularly perceived, is they were aiming for votes for women on equal terms to men. And whether a man could vote depended on a property qualification. As I said, the 1884 Reform Act enfranchised most men. I think you had to pay £10 of rent or earn so much a year that you could vote as a man. The problem with this is that if they're campaigning for votes for women who have this, then again, only a certain number of really wealthy women would have the money to be able to join in and to be enfranchised. And then again, like their aims are not as radical as their actions. They go and they are militant, but they're only really trying to get a limited measure of franchise. If women were to have been enfranchised on this, then only one-sixth of the electorate would have been female. And you have to think, how much really could that have achieved in ways of trying to better lives for women in general? As I said, the organisation was quite middle class. The woman on the left is Christabel Pancho. This is her friend Annie Kenny. She was the only working class organiser of the WSPE. Although she did organise things and she did do a lot of work for the campaign, but she's seen by some historians as a face so that they don't people don't think that they are trying to distance working class women. They use her so that they won't be criticised. The idea of only enfranchising a small thing, a small like um, majority of women, minority of women, is criticised. It said that it's not votes for women, but it's votes for ladies. <laughs> and again, that's a quote from Dora Montefiore. Okay, so many women who were originally part of the movement just broke away. They thought, no, we're not being involved in this, it's too elitist. And they feel like the Pancras have really sold out the original, sold out just to try and get whatever they can. And it's become too exclusively middle class. And these are some examples of women who broke away and why they did it. Here she is, Dora Montefiore and Adelaide Knight, they set up a branch of the Women's Social and Political Union in London. As I said, it was run under a system of hierarchy, so whether or not a branch would be set up would be the decision, not of women who felt the initiative to go and spread this idea, try and get it out, but it would be um, decided by the Pankers. Now, these two women just went out and set up this organisation which they, the Pankers really weren't happy about. They had strong words with them about it. Another problem with the Canny Town branch that they, in London was that it advocated adult suffrage, adult suffrage being universal suffrage for both men and women, and that was a big point of friction between these two women, women of this branch, and the mainstream organisation. They said that they'd broken their promises to the working women which what I find really interesting is the splits within the family which reflect the splits within the movement and how far and how really mean Emily could be and how far she'd go to try and get this limited measure. Adela Pankhurst was the youngest sister and she was described as the black sheep among organisers. When women when they split away from the Independent Labour Party, people who founded 
the group who had quite left-wing convictions had to really keep their mouths shut. They weren't allowed to express what they said because they didn't want to offend women who could give them financial support. So Adela Pankhurst, this is Emily's daughter, doesn't manage to do that. She makes a speech advocating adult suffrage, which is just completely against what her mother thinks. And her mother banishes her, which is a quote I found in about several books, banishes to Australia. She says, here's 200 pounds. I want you to emigrate to the other side of the world. And I want you to promise to never speak in England ever again. Theresa Billington Gregg is the most probably well known person who was against the WSP and broke away from them. She founded the Women's Sweden League. Her problem with it was mainly that it wasn't very democratic. In 1907, she, found, she wrote up a new constitution which she was going to present at a congress of lots of different all the representatives of all the branches of the union to come together and she presented this to Emmeline and what it basically did it gave women, all women who were involved more of a say in what was going to happen and what their policies were going to be when they were going to be doing things and what they actually were Emmeline tore this up dramatically in front of everybody and said nobody has to be in my army if they don't want to be and this is a quote from Theresa, and it basically sums up everything, all the different reasons why women split away. It said that WSP has cut down its demand for one of sex equality, for one of votes on a limited basis. It has suppressed free speech on fundamental issues. It has gradually edged the working class element out of the ranks. It has become socially exclusive, continuously correct, gracefully fashionable, ultra respectable, and narrowly religious. This isn't in mainstream, when you learn about this in school, you have to learn about this in England when you're 14 years old. And you've just told that these women were great and they're really radical. None of this is spoken about. And again, this is trying to establish, well, you know, challenge established narrative. Yes. Female chartists, sort of from the 19th century, distance themselves from any ideas of suffrage movement because they were always brought up by middle class women. What um, is interesting is how some feminist movements internationally sort of do follow a trend like of being quite exclusively one group of people who were generally educated. An example of this is in 1848 some feminist activities here in New York where the women who were like meeting together and organising, did not make any efforts to try and include factory workers and black women who arguably were the most oppressed in the country. The other thing I want to talk about is militancy. Obviously, it shows how passionate they are. It was mainly their aim was for it to publicise the movement, to get it into the national headlines and make people way more aware of what was going on. But there's some aspects of it, and I want to really question how radical things were. This is a picture of Emily and Christabel in prison in Holloway Jail. Suffragettes so would get themselves in situations to try to be arrested. And obviously this would play upon society's sort of we, what the problem was was the suffragettes were middle class and so they wouldn't they weren't women who would have been to prison at the time they were trying to get these respectable women to be put in prison so that society would be shocked why are you doing this to respectable women but this distance and really annoyed working class women more because they were thinking well we've always been sent to prison for what we've been doing and it's quite interesting to note that when one middle class suffragette dressed up in working class clothing when she was taken to prison along with her sort of suffragette comrades she was treated a lot worse she was beaten she was had a lot less privileges as they did in the prison which is interesting to so the 
suffragettes are trying to campaign to be recognised as part of the democracy and be as strong, responsible as men and worthy of respect. But sometimes they try and play the victim and they deliberately try to get themselves put in prison and say, look what men are doing to us. Look how we're being treated in these prisons. And this was seen by some people as counterproductive because they're not trying to say we are equal to men and we can be treated in the same way. They're trying to play on this perception that women need a greater care and special consideration. Again, the idea of distancing working class women was a feature of some of the militant activities. The suffragettes set fire to this race course in 1913. When the level of militancy escalated to arson, quite a few people broke away, including Sylvia Pankhurst, because they thought they're doing far too much for a too small a measure of franchise and it's going too far. The thing with setting fire to stuff and being put in prison, working class women found it really difficult then to contribute to the movement because if they were to be put in prison, they would be in a real problem. Middle class women had servants and maybe maids or someone to look after their children to clean and cook, cook and be in their homes. Working class women didn't have the sort of safety net the middle class women did. And that's why this does distance them even further. Another thing about questioning how radical they were was what else were they doing in society at that time? What were they trying to achieve? The WSPU was ultimately and only campaigning for the vote. They just, that's what they saw as the be all and end all of campaigning. Emily says, our members are absolutely single minded. They concentrate all their forces on one object, political equality with men. No member of the WSPU divides her attention between suffrage and other social reforms. That means these sort of social elite middle class women weren't, weren't really allowed by the leaders to join in with other social issues. Other groups I'm going to talk about later thought, well, what on earth is the point in that? Why are you trying to get the vote if you're not going to imagine how it could be used in, in areas such as campaigning for birth control and equal pay in work? Next one. Yes, I've, been taught, I've spoken quite a lot about Emmeline and Christabel and how, really, how there are misconceptions towards them. And I'm going to talk about Sylvia, who was quite a bit different in many, many ways. Sylvia is called, in England, the most prolific female British communist there ever was. And obviously, she was not happy when they started to move away from the ideologies and the concepts that she helped found this group on. In 1912, she went to London with her American friend, Sally Emerson, against Christabel and Emily's will and advice. And she, because she wanted to go and set up a group and a part of the, a branch of the union in the east end of London, which is much more working class. And she elected to speak on behalf of working class women, which was something they really didn't want them to do. They didn't want them to offend women who could give them financial support. And they thought that it wasn't right because she wanted to set up a group to advocate universal suffrage rather than limited suffrage. London Federation of Suffragettes is founded by Sylvia Pankhurst. Here she is in front of a bookshop which they took as their original headquarters. The people she's talking to are a mixture of working class men and working class women. And that's who she's trying to talk to. She's not trying to aim the message and trying to recruit many women from a higher class. She's trying to get it out to anyone who's around on the street. In 1913, Chris Emily, no, Sylvia was summoned to France, where Emily and Christabel were in hiding. They were trying not to be arrested, because obviously so all the suffragettes were repeatedly arrested, and she was trying to evade arrest at this point. So Sylvia goes to France to see her sister and her mother, and is told, basically, that her group could either drop its working class convictions, its ideas of bettering conditions for all workers, 
find better conditions for women in their domestic and their social life. And to <coughs> not all this, or it would be expelled and excluded from the room. And she said, well, no, this is what I believe in. This is what these women believe in. The vote, we need, we need the vote to fight against poverty and destitution, not to brag that we're on equal terms to men. So, again, like they did with Adela, Emily and Christabel break away completely with their family because they have completely different political convictions. Differences between groups can be seen in their reactions to war. In 1914, the Women's Social and Political Union stops all its campaigning for the vote and decides to work alongside the government, people they've been victim, well, not victimizing, I suppose, they've been trying to hurt all these years, and they decide to work alongside them to try and call for things like conscription into the armed forces for men. They were women who organized giving out white feathers. In Britain, women who gave out white feathers, they gave them to men who refused to fight, and it was sort of seen as a sign of cowardice, and it was like a really horrible thing to do, and they were organized. It was organized by like members before this. What's different mm -hmm. about the um, East London Federation of Suffragettes is that instead of working saying, oh yeah, let's go to war, they set up things like unemployment bureaus, they gave out free milk and child, they did things like childcare, they tried to get better, try to better the wage gap between um, men and women, especially if women were now entering places in work that were not been taken by them. Again, the suffragette newspaper, which had been called Votes for Women, was named Britannia. <coughs> and it's like, well, they've dropped anything. They're trying to do anything they can. They're going to any means to try and get the vote for this small minority. So 1918 is the first measure of women's enfranchisement in England, in Britain. This is the Representation of the People Act, where women over 30 who were on the government register or met the property qualifications previously imposed on men were granted the vote. Women made up about a third of the electorate at this point. More women were enfranchised than they'd been aiming for. But what's quite interesting to note is that after this happened, these public figures who've been in the limelight for the past couple of decades completely drop out. They say, all right, well, we've got the vote for some women. We're not going to keep campaigning for women in other sectors. Okay, so what I said at the start is I was trying to work out, well, what were, how could this be just due to the exploits of a few elite women and what were working class women doing at this point? <coughs> A group that I discovered <coughs> upon reading the book One Hand Tied Behind Us, which is the only book written about this group, are called the Radical Suffragists. <coughs> These women were also from the North, which is where the WSP was originally founded. There, they were made up of loads and loads and loads of working class women, or women whoever wanted to join in. They advocated things like birth control, wider social reforms and adult suffrage. What they found campaigning a lot harder than the women in the suffragettes because they had to work, they had to look after their children and their contribution in the home and in work was so fundamental to keeping their like children fed and things like that. Some woman says, no course can be won between dinner and tea. And most of us who were married had to work with one at the time behind us. Working class women within this group were then given a sort of platform to express their views that they'd never had in the area of suffrage before. Helen Silcott, for example, who was just your average mill worker, was really great and she raised the issue of female suffrage at the notoriously hostile trade union conference in 1901. And this led to 
the trade union conference calling for a motion for adult suffrage to encompass both men and women due to what she said in her speech. She said, uh, one of the reasons the government didn't enfranchise women was that they said that they were sufficiently protected by their husbands and their husbands could vote for them. Why do they need two votes? They're just going to vote for the same people. But she said that not all women were married. And she points out that the vote would give women a means to step up and to better themselves in their lives, their social lives, their domestic lives, their day-to-day -day experiences. And it would enable them to live and not be able to exist. Selena Cooper, I think, is an example of a woman just from the social from the social class of working class who was really given opportunities she never had before due to the works of the group. The group, all these different women, were trying to instead of going for sensationalist activities to raise the issue on a national level again level get it in the newspapers. They were running a grassroots campaign, trying to get trade unions involved, women's cooperative girls involved, things like that. And try and bring into the ideas and the minds of working class women and women all over the country what getting the vote for them could mean. Is different. She became the first working class woman to be elected as a poor law guardian who sort they sort of looked after in and was chosen to, the only working class woman who was chosen to present a petition to Parliament on women's suffrage to the Prime Minister Asquith. Again, what I've said there, the radical suffragists were, ran, were suffragists because they couldn't be militant. There were examples of them throwing bricks and things like that, but they were, they were mainly constitutional. The things that they do, their methods were they sit outside their mills and just try and get women to sign. And they did manage it, and they managed to have a petition of over 60,000 names of working class women to try and bring on and gain suffrage for women in England. This is like a real important thing, I think, what the point that Selena Kuti said. She said, women do not want their political power to enable them to boast that they are on equal terms with men. They want it for the same purpose as men, to better conditions, make the loss of the work of pleasanter. We do not want it as a mere plaything. The radical suffragists, other groups, working class groups in the world, obviously had a lot of friction between the mainstream, so, uh, mainstream women's social and political union suffrage campaign because they just couldn't understand what was the point in them trying to just get the vote and not letting their members involve themselves in other social reforms and social struggles. Okay, so it's really important to see that women from all over the country, all their different classes, contributed to the effort of gaining enfranchisement for women. As I said, over 60,000 women signed that one petition, and that's just from the north of England. There were petitions all over the place. It wasn't just the exploits of a couple of well-known public figures who that got women different, got, got women the vote in 1918. I think Christabel and, and the WSP movement was a struggle for more privileged and educated women to take their seat in government and represent their class interests. And I think the different different views of Christabel and Sylvia really sum up the different ideas and approaches from different social circles to the question of suffrage and what it could mean and what its potential was. But then for Sylvia, the East London Federation of Suffragettes, the radical suffragettes and other working class groups, the suffrage movement was the struggle for freedom from one poverty and oppression. And they saw enfranchisement as a stepping stone to social reform. A Pankhurst and the militant suffragette movement um, is seen as the main reason for women gaining the vote in 1918. But in fact, thousands of women from across the country and from every social class were involved. And they were the ones who brought the issue 
not just into the national media, but really down into people's day-to-day -day lives and got them thinking what it could mean if they were to be empowered in this way. The granting of suffrage in 1918 is in some ways attributed to the women's contribution in the war effort. What is important to see is that women who really contributed in this way were working class women in their teens and their twenties. And it, they, they were the ones challenging the sort of Victorian idea of double standards, and that women were inferior to men and incapable of carrying out the same tasks. Not the middle class conservative feminists who didn't really, they did things in the war like trying to get men to fight and scripts and organize demonstrations and rallies to raise national morale, but not, they didn't actually contribute any way economically. The suffragists also showed that women for every class were capable of operating within a democracy. What was a problem with the militancy of the WSPU was that there were some people and groups who were really reluctant to give women the vote because they weren't sure what effects it would have upon them and whether they would become unfeminine. This is quite a late Victorian idea which carried on that women who were empowered like this would lose their femininity and they'd become not women anymore. <laughs> it's really strange, like, I found one source that said that if women were to vote, they would become lesbians and they would, <laughs> like, they wouldn't be able to conceive because they could vote. That's ridiculous. But the problem with all the militancy and this sensationalism and the attacks that the WSPU did is for some people was confirming the idea of what happened to women when they got involved in politics and they didn't really see how people would react to the things that they were doing. Another issue was that during this time obviously there's a lot of insurrection in Ireland at this point. The government didn't want to be seen to be giving in to terrorists, these women who were fighting, who were putting, setting things on fire, attacking people, and stuff like that. And they were reluctant to give in to this terrorism. And that, a problem with it was that it tainted the whole movement, even for women who weren't involved. Suffrage was then seen as something that was quite taboo, even if they didn't agree with setting fire to houses or poisoning people's pets and things like that. Okay, so in terms of feminism and wider emancipation, the radical suffragists and the East London Federation of Suffragettes and other groups like that that we don't hear about, they really set the ground for campaigning for better lives for women, I think. Stuff like campaigning for birth control and bringing ideas like that down at a grassroots level is very important later on in more feminist, in feminist movements that come prior to subsequent to the war. But the WSP were only interested in campaigning for the vote and not for wider social reform. I think that this is generally why it shouldn't be that the contribution of women from all these working class groups should be marginalised. But I think that the contribution of the WSP and the Pankhurst should be less than it should be seen as not as people should see that it wasn't just them and that their contribution wasn't as big as and the only reason it was.
from sources I found about it in terms of the East End of Federation and suffragettes particularly, they were involved and welcomed in that respect. But I think the WSPU, I'm not sure what their policies were on race, but because it was so deeply embedded in class and people's, lots of black or minority people would be lower class, they, wouldn't be, they weren't involved in the militancy at that point. wasn't much of a black community in Britain at this time either, was there? I mean, the black yeah. community in Britain mainly arrived in the, in the 50s, post-Second World War. Okay. Uh, there are a few examples of women, black women being involved, especially in the East London Federation, but not, like, especially not in the mainstream thing that seems to be in terms of And East London, I mean, it's yeah. got a, I think, the history of kind of diverse groups of people beyond, you know, from outside of England is quite rich, and I'm by no means an expert, but yeah. so I, I would imagine that that context would be the most fertile for kind of finding the the politics around suffrage, you know, different kinds of wings of suffragists and in relation to you know, other, other groups of people. That's true, and in fact, Emily and Christabel were quite reluctant for Sylvia to set up a branch there, not just because it was you know, very working class, because they were quite afraid of all the ideas and things that were embedded within that culture, because they were trying to attract conservative and feminists. They weren't trying to sort of, I don't know, trying to think how to phrase it really, like um, bring people together from all different races and different classes. They were all just into conservative. Suggested before there was a difference between the movement, the suffragette movement in the England and the United States. Say something about that. I don't know that much about the movement within the United States. I know that some of the methods that were used, both by the suffragists and the suffragettes, were employed in the United States, like rallies and things like that. But I'm not sure. I got there's a very good book by a woman called Gerda Werner putting, I think it's something putting women in social and political context. I've read it quite a long time ago and that had quite a lot about how some more, again, more conservative feminists in America distance themselves from women, in certain women in a way that the WSP is. But I'm not really even much about that. That's the extent. Right, yeah, well, let's give it a quick round. It's time. Five plus dates. Five plus dates. Do you want to hack on? Do you want another five minute break? We've got to be at, we've got to be finished by nine, I know that. Right, which is on then.